let's let's uh let's actually let's hey are you guys here to, to play a game or, or, or is that what we're here for oh, i thought this was a test oh a test no run. no oh, this, isn't, probably we're, we're large, this is probably a timeshare meeting i'm on the cruise <laughs> <laughs> do I look this like is a time show real estate salesman? agents? I'm leaving, yeah. right? right? I mean, Beth kind of looks like a real estate agent, but what? I thought is she was leading the meeting. It's that fake background that she. Yeah, has exactly. Back there. It looks, you look like you're sitting in a fake background because if you're green shirt, everything. It's looks... real. Is it? Though? Sure, it is. I'm anyway, real. hello everyone. Welcome to Wanderers Haven. Um, as you can tell, we are a chuckling lot, and that does not bode well for us actually being on time with anything that we are doing tonight. Um, but I am happy to actually be here with these wonderful people because we are going to have a rip-roaring good time, I hope, uh, in uh, a story that I have been working on for many, <laughs> many months uh, at this point and um, am happy to, to finally get to start telling. Before we get into that, though, we have a few different, like, logistical mundane things to take care of here i have just a, a couple of quick shout outs before i let these awesome people introduce themselves um some of the music that we're hearing tonight is from the uh the bumper screens was from tabletop uh, rpg music it was a collaboration piece that they did with uh jm peku who uh i uh, graciously uh am able to use some of their content uh the the scenery that's behind these people's faces that you get to see a little bit of in the bumper scenes um, is from Jan Peku. Uh, they are absolutely the epitome of uh, awesome art and uh, particularly awesome maps and such. Um, and if you're interested in, in those kinds of things, you should definitely check them out on Patreon. Although I'm guessing that if you're watching us, you probably know about them because they are amazing. Um, and then uh, some of the additional music that you uh, are getting to hear tonight is coming from tabletopaudio.com, uh, who uh, I love tremendously. I've been a Patreon of theirs for years, uh, and um, if they also offer a ton of free stuff at tabletopaudio.com, and you should definitely check them out. But that's enough for me for now. Uh, you get to hear more about me later tonight. Uh, let's kick this over to Beth. Tell us who you are and who you're playing tonight, Beth. Hi, I am Beth, not a real estate agent, but who knows. Um, tonight I am playing Barrick, who is a, um, a former soldier warrior guy turned military strategist. i um, very excited to see what happens uh, when Miko takes over. So we'll see. We shall indeed. Deb, who are you and who Hello. are you playing tonight? Hello, I'm Deb. I'm also not a real estate agent, uh, so just putting that out there. Um, I am playing Cassia. She is a cleric, and uh, she's a knowledge domain cleric, so she has uh, lots of wisdomy, knowledgey things going on. She is a historian and uh, was blessed by a god, and so has all sorts of fun things going on with that. So, great to be at the table. Nice. Uh, Ian. Hey, hey man. Um, I'm in the wrong Zoom because I am a real estate agent. No, <laughs> <laughs> no that's actually- The hat gave Hey, you guys, I'm Ian. I, uh, I play uh, Akris, and uh, he is a dragonborn warlock with a splash of barbarian in there and um he's an apprentice of the imperium vanguard academy so probably the youngest out of the group very kind of uh but we'll wait to see that in a minute super excited we will indeed uh jeremy you're playing a bird yes man? what you're playing a bird man is that what an air cooker is? <laughs> uh oh. I'm really gonna have to work on my character sheet then. Uh, <laughs> hey, I'm Jeremy. I'm playing uh, Zorvia, the Birdman. Can you tell us a little bit about your Birdman? <laughs> oh, I guess so. Uh, cuckoo, cuckoo, cuckoo. Um, I'm still deciding on what amazing accent my Birdman is going to have. His name is Zorvia Ironwind. Uh, he is essentially the the vassal in charge, or uh, like kind of a, a 
a lord of lords when it comes to taxes and land ownership. Um, and he makes sure that those other barons make sure or that they uh, send the knights and soldiers that are required of them to the Imperial Army. Um, can you do a he, Michael Keaton? Like which Michael Keaton? Like the Birdman Batman, Michael, Michael Keaton. Keaton. <laughs> oh, <laughs> I don't know. I've only seen that movie once and I don't remember wow. anything about it. Can you do <laughs> Missed Mr. Mom Michael Keaton? <laughs> maybe, maybe. I could probably do like like uh, Nolan versus Batman. <laughs> <laughs> yes. There's kind of an association there, I suppose. Right? What about Beetlejuice? We went Batman. Beetlejuice? What's that? You do Beetlejuice? Uh, yeah, I probably could. Nice. Yeah, let fun. me think about that one. Dial Sorry. it in. No. Well, uh, is there we, anything we, else that would you like to we know We'll find about? out in a little bit where what it's accent you end up falling on. Right. So. Kevin. It will change every day. It will Kevin, change every day. Kevin, who are you and who I, are you playing? I'm Kevin. How did you end up here? What? And uh, <laughs> um, yes, I tonight am playing Develian Illustriel, who is a high-ranking noble elf who has got some deep ties into the Empire's uh, throne, so to speak. And I am thrilled to be here playing this character who is going to have some uh, secretive measures that he goes to. So we'll see how that plays out. But uh, yeah, Elven Bladesinger. So love it. Indeed. Should be awesome. Um and I personally also would like to uh, take a moment here before we dive deep in and give a special shout out and uh, ultimate thank you here to Miss Beth Masco because she did something amazing for all of us. Uh, let me see if this is going to work correctly. Nope, it's not working. It's there. I can see it. There it is. Hey, it finally me. caught back up. <laughs> this amazing map that you are seeing right now, this insanely detailed map. Let me just zoom in here so you guys can see some of this craziness was I can't created. You made that with AI. That's amazing. Oh God. Beth, <laughs> Beth AI. <laughs> AI would have done it so much faster. <laughs> uh, this wonderful map, this is the uh, the capital city of Intresca. Oh. Um, known as Vastaris. I can see my house from here. Uh, and uh, <laughs> Miss uh, Miss Beth here just knocked it out of the park with this amazing, amazing city map. Uh, and soon she's gonna have a a world map for us to uh, to see for Estera, nice. uh, which I yeah. cannot wait to see what kind of craziness she gets up to um, <laughs> after seeing this. Uh, if any of you are interested in any of the things that uh, uh, of the world, I should say, um, and seeing some more of Beth's work, uh, you can check out that as well as the, the a lot of things that I've written about my world on uh, over at um, there's a link in my link tree, like Jeremy just put in the chat. Thank you so much. Uh, you can check out uh, Estera.theoksgm.com, and that'll take you right to the uh the world page that has all of the the crazy awesome details um and uh yeah there's going to be more stuff there coming in the future thank you so much jeremy much appreciated so let us dive in here and talk a little bit about this uh this adventure that everyone is about to take part in uh, welcome everyone to east Terra. It is a realm of ancient civilizations, timeless magic, uh, monumental aspirations. It is uh, a world. Messing with me. It's it's a world of grand empires or, that rise and fall in the amazing breadth of time, uh, both recorded history and not, where individuals of extraordinary metal shape. The course of the history of the world. Ysterra itself was born from the dying breath of a god. It's filled with wonder and terror. It's imbued uh, at its heart with magic uh, populated by fantastical creatures and defended by the formidable Ascendant, the wielders of the divine motes of power from the god that had died upon the very crust of the planet. In the current day, 
This vibrant realm teeters on the precipice of a transformative era, an industrial revolution of sorts. The tale that we have gathered to tell, though, is one from the annals of history. As the strands of destiny weave together, we get to see the mighty empire of Entresca, where the echoes of centuries of triumph still reverberate throughout the streets, halls, and hearts of its people. It's an empire that has stretched its steel-clad hands across the vast continents of Insaris, and its ambition unquenched, its dominion unchallenged, as it has conquered almost the entirety of said continent. Yet within this grandeur lies an unseen fracture, a silent tremor heralding the twilight of an era. 1400 years now after the founding of Entresca, it stands on the precipice of change. It's the age of steel supremacy, an epoch marked by the rise of a ruthless and ambitious emperor, Gerantan, whose insatiable thirst for conquest has led the empire to unprecedented heights. But as heights go, they eventually can fall. The intoxication of power can shroud one's vision, and in its shadow, the shadow of Entresca, that is, discontent brews. Seeds of rebellion sprout, and the hearts of the oppressed yearn for freedom. The echoes of a brewing storm grow louder, yet... They remain unheard in the grand halls of the capital of Entresca. And this is where our tale begins, in the heart of this dying empire, our players gathered today. They are paragons of Entrescan society, former military commanders, politicians, uh, prodigies of the arcane, devout clergy, nobility, they all stand at the heart of this change. They are about to embark on an adventure that will weave their names into the tapestry of Estera's history. Whether they quell the sparks of the rebellion or fan the flames of the revolution, whether they stand as the bulwarks of the empire or the architects of a new era, time will tell. In their hands lie the threads of fate, ready to be spun into a story of courage, betrayal, liberation, and transformation. Welcome, my friends, to Estero. Welcome to Entresca's Requiem. And now we begin by introducing two of our characters uh, in a different state than uh, everyone might have expected. Um, Beth, Ian, I need for you two to roll initiative, please. <laughs> Will do. <laughs> okay, here we go. That's how let's, you start it off. Let's get this party started. Okay. 19. Oh, that's pretty good. Ian? I also got a 19. Oh. Who has the higher okay. dexterity score? I have an 18 dex. Uh, yeah, he goes first. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> Beth, Ian. Can we get uh, a physical description of uh, your two characters, Barrack and Acherus, please, as we find the two of you engaged in battle with one another in the uh, back terrace of Barrack's decently sized estate as the two of you are sparring with one another. We'll start with you, Beth, since you got initiative. Um, yeah, so... Barrick is um, a, a former military uh, whiz. So he, even though he's around um, 50 or so years old um, as a human, you know, that comes with its uh, aches and such, but he is still very fit and um, giving this kid a run for his money. Um, he has uh, short cropped hair that's sort of graying in places, um, not quite a, a beard, but just a little bit of uh, stubble. Um, he has a, a rather serious expression as he wields his very large uh, falx sword um, with a sort of curved end to it. Um, as he, you know, engages in, in combat and um, 
you'll see, even though he is very focused and um, very intent on really winning this uh, sparring session, um, every so often you'll see moments, flashes of uh, pride and perhaps concern, depending on how things are going, um, as he just, you know, continues to, to spar with Akris. And, and Acris, this being a familiar situation for the two of you uh, that you've trained together several times over the many months uh, that you all have known each other, what does Acris look like in this circumstance? Um, so Acris being a, a young dragonborn, young in age, but in um, full matured feet, uh, physical capability, um, facial expression, stressed. Uh, even though that this is something that he's very used to, especially when uh, sparring gets Barrett, um, every time there's always something new that comes, and just when he feels as though that he's got the edge, something else is pulled out to where the learning continues to happen. Um, he's somewhat tall. He's definitely uh, a bit taller than Barrett, I would say, if we had to do it like maybe about 6'5". He's a tall dude. Um, but very young. Slim, kind of just like corn fed built like not super big but you know he's worked on fields and right now he's definitely heavy breathing weapon in one hand conjuring something in the next hand just trying to figure out what his next move is going to be nice and just so you two are aware you are both at half hit points at this point okay. you are sweating quite a lot as you've been sparring with one another for uh, quite a bit now. Um, Barrick, you had initiative. <laughs> okay. Um, well, I'm going to make my first attack uh, with my big-ass sword. Um, before I... <laughs> I don't know, man. This is wild. Um, before, <laughs> I, uh, before I swing, I'll, uh, I'll just say... Now, you got to make yourself the smallest target possible and just go for it. Uh, the first is an 18 to hit. It's okay. Sorry. Uh, <laughs> eight points of damage. And then I'll immediately go in for my second strike. A 20 to hit. Oh, definitely. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> 13 points of damage. Um, and as I as I am able to get you twice, I'll uh, I'll just say now pay attention and go again. That's only a twelve. This is okay. Great. Um, uh, how does uh, Acris <laughs> deflect the the third strike that he knows is coming? So after the first two, I would think that Acris is like on, like on the ground, like he's on his butt. He's more so confused about the comment that was made make yourself the smaller look how am i supposed to make myself small and that's when the next one comes in and um he deflects it with his um equa when the when the steel comes through and um with his free hand goes for an elders blast attack um, yeah very <laughs> okay uh that's a 19 to hit so yeah, that'll hit well, hang on now. Did you roll that with disadvantage? Because you're doing a ranged attack roll into melee against a melee uh, no, opponent. No, I didn't roll that at disadvantage. You have to roll that with disadvantage. The 19 still falls flat. Like, because it was 16 on the die plus 8 on, on right. my disadvantage roll. Yeah, yeah. You, you get me. Okay, perfect. Um... And that's just with the first bolt. Do you have anything special with your Eldritch Blast that, like, knocks Barrack back or anything? Uh, yeah, so I think with that, you see kind of like a small uh, purple, like, conjuration flame that comes up. And it's not something that, like, normally with an Eldritch Blast, you would see some range on it. It's more so if he force pushes it into your leg to kind of, like swoop and knock, knock you down on that yeah. <laughs> seven points on the first one. Oh. all right and you um, still have how many more bolts two more <laughs> so uh i think with 
with that uh, first bolt, you kind of hit a knee, and then mm-hmm. I meet you eye to eye with your knee, and I go, smallest target, huh? And then with that one, it's more so of like, you see his hand come over, kind of like give you like a shoulder pat, but with that, he does the second, um, <laughs> which is for an additional eight points. That is cold. All right. Yeah. And then... Uh, and you're rolling with these with the disadvantage last... still, right? Because it's a separate attack roll for each bolt. Yeah, the yeah. the the first one was um, a 17. I'm sorry, I should have said that. 17, and then I got a natural 20. On the side. Yeah. Oh, okay. Uh, yeah. So natural 20 means that you got a critical, which according to my rules means that you maximize the dice and then roll your dice on top of that. So what's your normal single bolt Eldritch Blast damage? So for this one, it, so it's it's 1d10 plus 2. For the second one, it was 8. Well, if it's 1d10 plus 2, so you uh-huh. rolled a 6 then? Yeah. Okay, so you you instead did um, 18 points of damage, not 8. Oh, for the critical? Okay, yeah. So it's 18 points of damage on that next Amazing. one. Amazing. Um, and then I'll roll for the last one. Heck yeah. I don't think I'm going to beat that one. Okay, so that's going to be an 11. That misses. It misses. Okay. So I think with that one, it's it's kind of more so of, like, he hits you on the leg, your knee, and your eye to eye comes over for, like, kind of like a, a sneak on the shoulder. And then uh, Akris kind of leans back and he puts his hand in front of his chest to try to give you, like, a little bit of range on that. And then that one's that's the one that misses. Okay. Um, Any, and do you have anything, anything else that you're doing? I have another attack, actually. Get it. <laughs> I can do. So with that, I'm actually going to use my, my melee weapon to kind of... Um, to kind of sweep you fully off your feet as I gain my traction. So... Is that a bonus action attack? No, I, it, I get two attacks per uh, action. Right, so casting a spell is a full action. Casting a spell is not an attack action. Even though my Eldritch Blast is a cantrip. Yep. Cantrips are okay, full action. So then that's both? That's okay. both of your melee attacks. It, like, you then do that in place of the attack action. So cool. if you uh, had, like, a bonus action attack thing, you could, you could do something like that. But you basically use up your entire uh, action casting your spell understood uh then no i don't have anything i mean there's something i could do but i don't want to do it in this situation <laughs> oh shit all right <laughs> Beth, we're back to you uh, uh so barrack is gonna uh get up and then just say you gotta vary your attack pattern you don't want to become predictable like me and uh make another attack with his big ass sword 13 so nice. as he's getting up, he sort of stumbles a bit as he goes. Um, he's going to realize that even though he is uh, getting on in his years, he's not done yet. And I'm going to activate as a bonus action my fighting spirit, which will give me 10 temporary hit points. Thank you. And um, advantage on my attack rolls until the end of my turn. So my last two attacks will have advantage. Nice. So I'll come down with one of them. Um, okay, so that's a 17 for 28. Yeah, definitely hits. Okay, uh, and then uh, I'll do some damage on that. 11 points of damage there. Um, and then I will sort of come from uh, the, the other side once and then back again uh, for my second... Yeah, that, that's 17 for 28 again. Um, and another eight points of damage. Um, and... I'm dry heaving a little bit. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> Akris is like, the, 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 the second hit knocked some wind, and he's yeah. like, <gasps> okay. Just, Focus yeah, on your breathing. Small. Just just get up. Come on. Yeah, make yourself I'm small. Square up. What are your feet yeah. doing? I don't know. I can't see what they're doing. You got it. You got it. All right, come on. <laughs> All right. Okay. Uh, you're perfect. you're up, Akris. Um. So with that, uh, I just 
I'm a little upset, but I also don't want to hurt this person because we're I know we're trading, but I'm also very upset. So in this one, um, I'm just going to take uh, my ill and I'm going to go ahead and swipe um, at your legs again, just to kind of like disable you as best as I can. <laughs> so, uh, boom. Oh, okay. It's 18 on the die. 26. Yeah, that'll hit. Yeah. Uh, perfect. It's going to be five points of damage on that. And then I'm just going to, Akris is just going to go ahead and with one like swift movement to like hit one leg, just going to bring it back down uh, both double handed on that. And we'll just bring it in this. Boom. It's a 24 to hit. Yeah. And then that's going to be for an additional nine points. Okay. All right. Yep, that and, one. Uh, I definitely felt that one. Yeah. Bonus action. Um, I'm going to look Barrick in the eye because I, I feel like we're still really close. And I'm just going to go make yourself smaller, huh? And I'm going to rage. And you just see that uh, Akris's eyes, they go from what would seem to be a pupil to where they just glaze over orange. And it's just like a silent rage. Yeah. Barrick will and smile at that. Yeah. There, that's me. All right. Okay. So, uh, as you uh, as you finish those swings, and the two of you um, appear uh, very bruised and battered from um, from all of this foray, uh, you both hear a <clears throat> clearing of the throat come from uh, just behind you all. Um, and you turn and look to see uh, Meryl Barrick um, coming down the steps of the, the chateau, uh, walking towards the two of you with a tray in her hand that appears to have uh, some fresh lemon juice or orange juice or some kind of fruit juice uh, cocktails uh, on them, uh, along with uh, some light snacks. Um, and she walks over and sets them down to uh, on a table just to the side of the, the back garden that you all are training in. Uh, and she calmly folds her hands uh, in front of her and says, Are the two of you quite done now? <laughs> I, I hope so. I don't know. I just, uh, I kind of felt like I was getting uh, the hang of it there. <laughs> Before you break my knees maybe we should uh just give it a couple minutes yeah yeah no absolutely uh, 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 yeah. that was fun <laughs> that was very good very good you, yeah. you got to stay confident i, I saw you kind of glazed over a couple moments there you got to just you know keep with it well it's just it's some i mean i don't know it's it, it's not like studying but you're, you're like all in someone's face and then like you got like the energy going and i don't know you kind of I just kind of get like lost in it for some reason. And I know that's not good. I know you always said maintain your focus, maintain your control, but I don't know when you're just like right in it, everything's going, you know, you're moving. I kind of forget where you're at. I know. I know. All right. Well, let's drink some juice. Let's uh, yeah, yeah. take, take a moment. And I'll sort of well, like dab at his face. All the... You're walking away and Akris behind you. Like if the camera was like panning, it gets fuzzy. He's doing this. He's like, like shadow boxing. He's like, yeah, <laughs> that was pretty good. As wonderful as it is to, to watch the two of you do that. Are the both of you quite okay? You look horrible. Not that you what? look tremendously good on, when you do these uh, trainings, that's... as you call them not the nicest thing you've ever said to me but uh i i don't disagree <laughs> walking up actors 100 percent accurate though my back hurts um <laughs> but no i think we'll be okay uh yeah just a few um, scratches and as he says that barrett goes to sit down and uh tries to hide a, a bit of a creak in one of his knees after Acris just totally sliced it I think Akris helps him to sit down. Not like in one of those, like, hair old man ways. It's more <laughs> sort of like, hey, yeah, yeah. Oh, gosh. That was good, though. Did you see what he did? 
Oh yes, I was I, watching him quite thoroughly beat you to a pulp. I mean, I, that means that I'm doing my job. Yeah, I wouldn't have, I wouldn't have had to do that if I didn't feel like I had to. For a second there, I thought you were really gonna like, like that was it. You never know. Maybe it was it. Also, you were pulling your punches. I could see it. No, I mean, I'm old, but I'm not that old. <laughs> In the back of Akris's head, he's just like, I wasn't really pulling any punches <laughs> yeah no i mean we're just training right like that's you don't want to go like full you know then i would have to explain i don't want to do that oh okay all right well next time we'll uh we'll have to see how this goes right next time i'm assuming that this is still going to keep pressing on even i mean actress Dear, how, how are your studies coming along? I, I noticed you've been spending a lot of time in the library of late. And look, I, I understand you are very dedicated, but do you ever feel like you might be a little too hard on yourself with the sheer volume of studies? Um, no, I, I mean, it, it does kind of come off that way, but I mean, me even being here is such an opportunity and um, I want to make sure I make the most of it I got my family like our nobility and you know our namesake within the empire it's extremely important and plus I have a lineage of others who they've excelled in whatever it is that they've done like my great uncle you know in this military prowess like I just don't want to be the one person in the lineage to not do something I mean you've been accepted into the Imperian Vanguard Academy. You've been studying there for what, almost a decade at this point. That yeah. is... There are s such a few number of people in the Empire that actually get to even think about attending such a university as that, and here you are having been there for this long at this point, and you, you have not been flushed out of it you you have you've stayed and persevered through it all and managed to succeed where so many others have failed so many times over surely surely that has to mean something at this point Acris hearing someone like list accomplishments or accolades it doesn't make him feel bigger it makes him feel smaller um and you can kind of see it on his face he's like rubbing his neck and like whatever sweats on his face he's he's more so focusing than that and he goes well i mean i'm very lucky it feels like someone's watching out for me and so I, I you know i just i just want to keep riding that plus somebody which seems like almost a decade ago said something to me and he looks at barrett progress to perfection right you, you know that uh perfection's not actually a thing right which is which is why you always progress to it <laughs> Good you man. said that well you if there's me. anyone that can tell you that perfection the uh, epitome of things that perfection is not it is certainly Barak hey, talking about this old guy <laughs> like really trying to deflect attention back off of all of you <laughs> In, in all of the interactions that you have seen between the two of them, you know that this is just the playful banter that, that they have with one another. That there's never been a single moment that not either of them has not indicated to you that they are deeply and dramatically in love with one another and have been for quite some time. And in this moment, I think, um, well, you tell me, and what, what do you think Acris sees when he looks upon these two uh, people obviously that care for one another in their middle years of life um, having this relationship that they have and you getting to experience it firsthand the very first thing is respect like right off the bat um, to, to see two people find each other and to spend all of this time together and it seem like it was still the first time that they're meeting or it was the first time that they said, I love you or what have you deeply respect. Um, because although he does have his family, his mother and his father are wrapped up in status and, uh, and business 
and keeping up appearances. There's not that warm feeling. So it's 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 respect. It's also it also shows him a piece of hope. After all of the studying, after all of the training, there may be an opportunity to where I could probably or Akris could probably get maybe like five percent of what that is. And so it's small smirk, glint in the eye just really just happy to be here and seeing this and as you're taking that in in the moment and and you see uh meryl uh and uh barrack um you know being playful in the way that they do uh there is another clearing of throat um you both easily saw the two individuals coming on to the the terrace from the um side walkway along the back uh, or along the western side of the home into the back terrace um you see uh, a young man um very obviously a page or a, a messenger of some kind um young human probably probably around the same age as Acris. uh in fact physically in you know number of years um wearing what is very very plainly and obviously uh the livery of the emperor and um, next to him is an exceedingly tall, and when I say exceedingly tall, I mean over eight feet tall, just mammoth of a woman with gray skin, uh, hairless, um, very, very obvious tribal markings uh, upon her body uh, that denotes that she is not born of the Empire, but she wears the armament of the Aegis Battalions. She carries herself with the same level of honor and training that Beric does. The Her uniform, her armor, her cloak, everything is in absolutely perfect position. Um, the giant greatsword upon her back uh, is very, very obviously pristinely crafted and taken care of. Uh, and as she stands there, uh, next to this young man, she stands at full attention, not making eye contact with Beric uh, at all, uh, waiting, obviously, for him to grant her the, the leave to rest her shoulders uh, as they are pulled tightly back behind her, awaiting um, the honorifics of this man of obvious stature above her. Um, Beric, first and foremost, will stand up straighter after the beating he just took and, you know, sort of get himself back into uh, his <laughs> precise posture. Um, uh, at ease, what what, uh, what can we do for you? Her shoulders slump slightly. It's kind of hard to tell. She is just massive in size, so the only real re way that you can tell that she ten that she releases some of the tension in, in her body is that like the muscles in her neck relax ever so slightly um, and she's just so tall standing so tall above all of you uh, she locks eyes with Beric uh, as soon as he um, gives her the, the orders to ease um, and she just nods ever so slightly uh, in his direction and then the uh, young man who was very nervous um, very obviously nervous amongst all of you kind of steps forward and you can see he carries in his hands a small parchment folded up uh, gilded uh, at the crests with gold uh, inlay and uh, steel lining along its outer edges to protect the contents of whatever is inside uh, and he clears his throat um, and he says, Lord Commander Beric, um, I have come with a message from the Emperor. Go on. It is, I'm, I'm sorry, sir, it's not for you. And he turns and looks at Acris. Uh, it's for you, sir. Um, the Academy uh, yeah. instructed us that we would find you here today. Yeah, yeah, no, absolutely. Um, looking at Barrett, go, go on. 
and he takes a few steps forward and he bends almost perfectly 90 degrees uh, at his hips uh, and he holds his hands out in front of him, uh, his head bowed down uh, and presents this, uh, <laughs> this message to you. I understand, but I appreciate it. Thank you. As soon as you take it from his hands, he jerks back upright, almost falling backwards, losing his balance with the sheer <laughs> force of it, uh, catches himself uh, and then nods and clears his throat and says, thank you, sir. Very much appreciated. Um, Lord. And he just turns and starts walking away. The soldier at his side rolls her eyes tremendously, gets her shoulders back, stands at full attention, and then looks at Beric waiting for dismissal. You're dismissed. Thank so. you. And she turns and walks out. Um, and this is a woman that Beric is familiar with. Um, he, uh, her name is Thurga, uh, and he knows her to be a very honorable warrior. Uh, he knows that uh, she fought up from being a slave. Um, into the potential of joining the ranks of the Aegis Battalions. Um, and while she still has, in the past 10 years since slavery was abolished, um, not performed exceedingly well in the areas of promotion, there's a certain notion that Beric has that the significant reason that she has not been promoted has nothing to do with her quality as a soldier, but her origins. And she has survived the harshest of battles she has fought valiantly and honorably for the battalions um she carries herself with the regalness of any intruscan probably more so than most intruscans uh and yet seeing her is a reminder to beric of the many many grievances that he still has even though he's no longer technically part of the battalions in that way because he now serves the emperor directly um he is reminded every time he sees someone like that of the incongruities with the battalions but acris there you sit uh holding this perfectly crafted parchment uh the steel bindings uh, along the outer edges easily snapped uh, to the sides. They're, they're made to be pulled apart uh, so that you can open up and see it. What do you do? No. I go ahead and open it. You, uh, with your finger claw, slice through the seal of the Emperor and open it. Uh, and there before you reads a letter. Uh, it is uh, a very simple letter. Uh, hereby requesting the Honorable Lord Acris of the Empyrean Vanguard Academy to attend the Festival of Steel as one of the many guests honored and held by the Emperor himself. Attending is requested. And you know when, and that's basically where it ends, and then it's got the sign and seal of the Emperor. Yeah. Um, and you know that it's not a request. Yeah. Now, the two of you know that, and Beric knew what this letter was as soon as he saw the messenger with it, as he also receives such letters every uh, every four years. Um, this is something fairly mundane for him as he has attended several of these festivals at the, the request of the Emperor. The Festival of Steel is a five-day celebration it is upcoming, it's just like a, a week or so out from now, um, in which the uh, Empire universally across the entire breadth and scope of the Empire celebrates the unity, prowess, and grandeur of the Empire. Uh, it is a vibrant celebration spanning basically the full five days of uh, just continuous revelry. And this year, in fact, holds some significance as it marks the 10th anniversary of the abolishing of slavery, something that is fairly deeply ingrained in the collective memory of the Entrescan society. And there is the entire fourth day of the celebration, in fact, is supposed to be in honor of the emancipation. 
so the the tone of this particular uh, festival is going to be interesting, we'll say. But Acris, this is your first time attending at the honor of the Emperor. What's your initial response as you look up from the letter and see Beric and Meryl, both of them kind of looking upon you with a beaming smile? Or at least Meryl, anyway. I don't know about Beric. I think reading it and going past where it says Lord Acris, he kind of goes, like, it's just... This is too much revelry for me. <laughs> and uh, he completes the whole letter. He gets to the part to where it says requested and just looking at how it's written, he goes, yeah, I've been there before. Um, and he looks up and I think when he initially looks up, you can see that he's not excited, but then he locks eyes with Meryl and sees her like joy and excitement and he, and he changes immediately, like in an instant. Uh, he's like, I... This this is gonna be fun. Um, I I assume you you guys you guys got an invitation too, yeah? No, this is just no. you. Well, you, you Meryl rolls her eyes as Beric says that. Yeah, that yeah. went completely over Acris's head because he's like, wait, no, going. surely like you would have to. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> we're, no, we're going. I, yeah, breath of uh, a sigh of relief because the thought of him having to do it alone. He was just like, oh, oh, okay, go, cool, okay. Um, well, yeah, no, this is, um, this is good. This is good. Um, should be a fun time. Indeed. And with that, we will cut away from the two of you, uh, and we will head over to Develian. Uh, Kevin, um, being, you know, at this point, a couple of weeks out from, uh, the, the festival, uh, Develian finds himself in a very familiar setting. Um, one of the many grand banquet halls of the Imperial Palace, thrumming with the uh, excitement of the Festival of Steel, uh, preparations being made, um, tapestries being hung, new dedications of art taking place uh, in honor of the festival for the emperor himself in hopes of, you know, whatever artist or noble had them commissioned gaining the uh, attention of the emperor as fleeting as that might be. This is where we find Develian Illustrial, uh, uh, standing amidst a group of high-ranking officials. Please, Tell us what Develian looks like as he is gathered amongst these individuals in a sort of, it's not really a party per se, it's more of just a, a gathering of friends, is the way of they course, like to think yeah. of it. You know, friends here supporting the, the Festival of Steel and preparations that are being made, friends with perhaps deep pockets or influence of some kind. What does Develian look like amongst these friends? Of course. Well, I think first off, we hear Develian's voice. It is a smooth, rich timbre, a, a lilting tone that marks him as elven even before we see him. And he says, of course, perfection can be found. It's simply a matter of striving for what is right, and what is just. I mean, surely you understand, Lord Umbridge. <laughs> and he kind of pokes a guy next to him. Uh, he raises a, a glass and he doesn't even drink from it. He just kind of raises it in the solution. And as we see Develian, he is... Uh, for an elf, uh, average height, so he's about five foot five. Uh, he's very thin, very handsome. He's got long flowing black hair with a silver streak across the left side, and it's all pulled back in that half uh, up, half down style that uh, we sometimes see elves will have. He's wearing rich, deep uh, court clothing, uh, tapestries and, of blues and golds, uh, very rich colors, no weapons to be found. He doesn't feel the need to have any sort of weapons upon him at something like this, but he definitely carries himself in a way that even without the rich clothing, even without the way that he carries himself, you can instantly tell this is a man of old money, as it were. This is a man who definitely has been part of this world for a very long time. Um, and with the kind of combined, you know, perhaps some of it's real, perhaps some of it's fake laughter of the group around him, he will look to them once more and say, 
I do believe that the uh, ceremony this year of steel will be quite a message to behold. It believes that the Emperor is actually inviting new and honored guests. It would seem he is reaching down below our high station to add a bit more flavor, a bit more color to its tapestries. What do you know of this? Well, the one of the young gentlemen uh, just in front of you, uh, a young human official uh, named uh, Saren, um, he uh, definitely the youngest member of this little group of individuals that you are uh, sharing some afternoon wine with. Um, he has a bit of uh, ambition about him. Uh, and in response to you, he says, well, I mean, I was perhaps one of those individuals that you speak of not four years ago, was I not, Lord Develian? Indeed you were, and your presence and your reputation still carries you to this day. You have not been forgotten for all of the good deeds that you have performed. I believe there is still a bit of the brown upon your nose as we speak, but uh, I am being a bit forward, I would, should certainly say. Uh, Lord Umbridge, you were speaking just the other day about the old time that I believe you had fought with the illustrious and rather elusive, I might say, of... Oscar Beric, uh, he is a man quite in, of import to the Emperor. I would like to believe a certain gossip, a certain murmuring about him has come forward. What do you know of the man? I have not met him myself. Well, I don't know if he's worth perhaps all of that that you're going on about, but um, I guess any, any eighth and scepter uh, is at least worth a, a mention, at the very least. I mean, he does honor and serve at the behest of the Emperor and advises him in military things, I assume. Indeed, he has a very intrepid story from what I have heard through the different rankings here. Is it true that he single-handedly carried the Western Front in the Battle of the Longhorn? Oh, I don't know about that. I couldn't see a man such as that carrying water in battle, <laughs> to be honest. Mm. People but may you, surprise you. yourself, you. What, what battles have you fought, hmm. Lord Develian? Do well, tell what, what noteworthy endeavors should we be on about for you? Why should we be worried about some Aethon Scepter name, whose name is so, such ill import? Mm, yes, indeed. Well, although my doings are a bit more private, I do not like to flash my clout about, unlike some that we see around here. I look to that young man again, just kind of peek an eyebrow at him. I have been known to find myself on the tight and close orders of the Emperor. When the time arises, my family, of course, are deeply connected to the Emperor and to the throne itself, and we would do anything that we can to make sure that that Empire will continue to reign in its supremacy. As you say that, there is a hearty laugh from one of the other gentlemen in the group that has been mostly quiet. Uh, at this point, uh, a man that you know to be Lord Argo Prumble, a exceedingly wealthy nobleman responsible for maintaining some of the most uh, promising trade routes between the eastern and western halves of the continent. Uh, he has reaped those rewards tremendously over the, his, uh, his many years uh, and virtually saved his noble family from bankruptcy um, when he came to the head of it. Uh, and he laughs, uh, as I said, tremendously in response to Develian making that comment and just after a moment starts coughing. <laughs> Pardon, pardon me. It's, I'm so sorry, Lord Develian. It seemed to me that you were implying that you have the ear of the Emperor at this moment. Is that what you said? 
Oh, Lord Prumble, I had not heard your approach. Uh, forgive me for not giving you the proper deference and bowing to not one but both of my knees at your approach. Well, I you would think not... that with such large ears, you would be able to hear damn near anything, but I guess that's <laughs> not a trait that you possess. Mm. Do tell, uh, Lord Develian, um, if you do have the ear of the Emperor in all of this, please, what are the reports from the East? I have been hearing many, many things that suggest there's a great unrest brewing. The people that live so far out um well we all know that they resent the throne and that grows each day do you think how long do you think before their small little riots turn into open rebellion <laughs> a rebellion directly against the throne <laughs> I would certainly hope that people of such an idea would be willing to accept the fact that they would clearly be routed securely, quickly, and efficiently. The Emperor, I do not directly have his ear, but he would have my rather large ears if he required them. After all, I am a servant of the throne, but As I would are like... we all? Of course, of course, Lord Prumble, I meant nothing against the sort. I would like to think, however, that the Emperor, if he does have any sort of dealings with quelling a rebellion, as it were, he would be willing to look to those who have a certain ear to the ground, as it were, people who perhaps know the ins and outs of society and know when to keep the proper level of discretion advised. And I'll finally take a sip of the wine glass that I have. Well. I mean, if that's the way you're going to advise the Emperor, maybe we need to find someone else that has his ear, because frankly, at this point, I think that we should unleash the Legionis on these ruffians and let them see the might of the Empire as it is. The entire strength of the Legionis against farmers with pitchforks and with trowels. <laughs> well, it would end things quickly. It certainly would. Lord Prumble, remind me to never go against you in the betting house. You clearly are a cutthroat and dashing man about the courts. You are not one to be trifled with, I can certainly tell. But you don't think that we should send Legionis in, then? I believe such a thing would be a waste of the Legionis' and the Emperor's power and strength. Surely this rebellion will die out on its own. They do not have the resources, funds, or leadership to make sure that such a thing would be possible. Well, Besides, what do they do when they arrive here? As any of my businesses have taught me, particularly those of the uh, vineyard variety, mm. even the smallest growth can turn into a vine that unroosts the entire spread. So what you simply suggest then, however, is it takes one bad seed to ruin the entire crop. Maybe a little more than a seed, and I think that's what we're facing now. These seeds are starting to affect business. And I don't like it when things affect business. I mean, especially in light of the events that are ongoing. We are just two weeks out from the Festival of Steel. This... This is going to be a grand event, Devellian. Ten years since slavery was abolished? You would think that the commoners would appreciate what the Emperor has done for them. I am certain that they respect and are grateful for what the Emperor provides them. It is through his great and powerful wisdom and knowledge that we continue to be an Empire. As I said, Lord Prumble, perhaps you should worry yourself with hedging out these small seeds that you believe are to be detrimental to your business. That seems to be a bit more what you are inclined to do. Uh, the Legionis will march if the Emperor commands them to, but we will see how things progress. Well, very well, Lord Devellian. I shall leave it to those that have the ear of the Emperor, I guess. And as he says that, you could see that the rest of the group that you were in, as the two of you were like conversing, they like were taking steps back. They were, oh. 
they, they didn't want to get involved in, in this little fray as uh, this kind of discussion is the sort of thing that um, if the ears of the Emperor hear of it can sometimes get his ire and that's the, the last thing that anyone in this group wants. Um, and so the party continues with, you know, some more mindless frivolity and uh, whatnot that Develian is exceedingly used to. Uh, and as Develian finishes the wine that he is drinking, uh, a, a servant, uh, you know, noticing the, the wine being empty comes over uh, and offers him uh, a new wine and presents it in front of him with a, uh, a small napkin underneath of the, the glass itself. Um, Develian immediately recognizes this individual as someone that he trusts, that he knows, uh, and um, he can tell very clearly that there is a small amount of writing on the inside of the napkin. A note that he was expecting, probably some tidbit of information from some other conversation that was taking uh, place amongst these various nobles gathered here at this festivity. So as I reach for the wine, I look across the... Oh, yes, of course. <laughs> I thank you for your time, I say to the man. And my the demeanor has changed. This over-the-top, frivolous arrogantness has dropped a little bit as I take the note and I palm it into my hand briefly as I take the wine glass, give him the slightest nod. And as I turn, I uh, find this soaring individual again. He's kind of come up behind me. And I look to him and I say... Young Master Sorin, have you heard of how important it is to mind an individual's own words? Are you aware? And I will reach into As the you're inside. saying that, Sorin yeah. was obviously paying attention to something entirely something not else. you, and, and yeah. he seems shocked. I, I'm, I'm sorry? Uh, oh, um, Lord Develian. Uh, uh, sorry, so uh, you were saying. Yes, I was. Keep this in mind, young Lord Sorin, and I will reach into the inside of my dress coat and I will pull out what looks to be a small quill, but it's made out of quartz. It's not a feather. It's a, this very elaborate, it's got lots of etching and runes upon it. And I will slowly draw it across so that he can see it. You may find that one's caution, one's import is best served with a steady hand and I will just take the quill, I'll tap his glass once, ding, and I'll put it back into my coat, give him a nod, and I'll walk away. And as I walk away, I will slowly open that note in a manner that only I can see what's inside of it. Great. Um, the, the Lord just stands there, his mouth kind of agape, completely flummoxed as to what that entire conversation <laughs> was about. As you as you walk away and, and glance at uh, the note containing information that you probably were expecting. And we will move on from there uh, as we make our way again, still a few weeks out from the festival. We make our way across uh, the capital city of Vastharis to a uh, cathedral of sorts, a gleaming bastion of stone and glass that juts up from the city street with uh, a regal quality about it and this seemingly brilliance of light just emanating from it even though the day is somewhat cloudy um, there is a warmth that comes from this hall this grand hall dedicated to the ascendant of praxis as we step into this space filled with uh, just a grand open entryway containing shelves upon shelves upon shelves filled with books and tomes and artifacts thousands of them in just this main hall alone and hints of side rooms containing smaller libraries dedicated to different subjects. Uh, Apraxis being an ascendant who is dedicated to knowledge and learning and teaching. We make our way up into the upper echelons of this grand hall and we see a 
a beautiful, by all appearances, elven woman, storming her way into her office, uh, her private office, even though it is private, still contains a dozen easily shelves uh, filled with books and tomes and scrolls and artifacts and the like. Uh, Deb, can you describe what we see as Cassia makes her way into her office, tossing the familiar mask that she dons somewhat frequently of late, tosses it upon the desk, seemingly in frustration at having left behind her meeting in which she had to wear it. Yes, uh, Cassia is as uh, you said, a seemingly elven woman. She's very, uh, she looks like she could belong to the nobility. She's very richly dressed. She's got this uh, sort of long flowing red dress slash robe on. Um, she has this sort of gold circlet around her head and has a couple of rings on her fingers and just a uh, tall, stately woman. She uh, if you look closely at her face, she has a couple of lines on her face, but she still looks quite young. Um, and she, yeah, throws this mask. Uh, it's it's sort of would cover three quarters of her face. Uh, plain looking sort of grayish silver mask on the desk. And as she tosses it down in obvious frustration, having had uh, another meeting that seemingly leading nowhere with no appreciable changes to uh, the society at all. Um, she notices quite clearly upon the desk the familiar letter with the seal of the emperor upon it. This letter she's received how many of these invitations over her many decades of life uh, at this point she's gone to so many of these festivals of steel uh, and yet this one, more so than any of the rest, somehow seems to, to weigh upon her. She stares at yet another invitation that she has to go to. How, do you, how does she feel in this moment? She thinks sort of wistfully about her favorite secluded corner of the Eternity Archive, and... Uh, I, I would imagine it's sort of labyrinthine in the midst of this cathedral. And so she has a favorite corner that's uh, just sort of dusty and forgotten and not visited by very many other seekers. And so um, she she thinks wistfully about the chair that she knows is there and the, the quiet and solitude that could be hers if she had time. As she contemplates turning and heading off in that direction to... Uh, perhaps take a few moments to herself in this secluded place that she loves so dearly. Of course, there is a knock at her door. Enter. Door opens with ease uh, at the gentlest of touch because everything in this cathedral is built to pristine standards. Uh, and she sees the familiar face of Acolyte Jorim, uh, a young man that shows a decent amount of promise, um, one that uh, Cassia is fairly familiar with, uh, probably someone that she hopes will eventually find his way out of the cloister of just books and perhaps dedicate himself to learning things of the real world instead of just what he finds in the, the various tomes uh, here in the, in the halls. Um, and given her ability to read people, uh, she knows instantaneously that uh, Joram standing before her with the sheer volume of sweat coming off of his brow and the heaving of his chest has run a decent distance, perhaps up many, many flights of stairs uh, to reach her chambers uh, and seemingly a bit out of breath uh, has something very important that he's trying to get either the courage or the physical stamina up to actually speak about. There's a, a, a pitcher of water and a glass that she'll pour him a glass of water and hand it to him and take a moment, catch your breath. As, as Cassia um, 
brings him the glass. He he just reaches out for it quickly at first, but then he like calms himself and reaches for it slowly and purposely as his training has taught him to do. He takes it, he nods uh, breathlessly, giving thanks. Uh, he takes several sips and calms himself. You can tell still, though, his heart is just racing. Uh, his, his pulse is up. He's still very... Um, frustrated uh, with with whatever it is that he came here to tell her. Um, and he stands there for a moment, finishes the, the glass of water and clears his throat. <clears> throat> um, I am I am so very, very deeply sorry that I have to come and approach you, um, my lady of the halls. Uh, there is um, there has been a, a, a thieving that has taken place and we have learned that there are a number of books and artifacts that have been taken from the temple based on uh, previous uh, uh, iteration of n examining all of our possessions and the one that was just completed this morning. I am so sorry to have to bring you this news. And he like genuinely looks crestfallen. Like, like he's not expecting you to punish him for this. Like you can tell quite clearly that the notion that someone has stolen knowledge from the halls of eternity, from this this place that houses knowledge, it 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 seems to be almost shattering the man as he's standing before you. I'm gonna cast calm emotions on him okay. and just get him to sort of take a minute yeah you cast what? calm emotions he's completely unprepared to have to resist such a thing not that he would resist it anyway um and immediately the uh the spell has has a an instantaneous effect he's still very obviously worried about what has transpired but the emotional aspect of it at least is taken away from him for the, for the moment and he just nods and says Thank you so much. Logic is our friend in these times. Was he, the content... he, like, he like repeats that under his breath as you continue. <laughs> was the content of what was taken, was it all about the same subject matter? What, what was taken? Oh, um, yes, of course. And he reaches into the folds of his robe and he pulls out a, a small piece of parchment, unfolding it. Uh, and he says... Um, we know definitively that there are seven of the things that um, were taken um, right now. There is still a, 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 a full preparation taking place to find out if there was anything else that was taken as well. The, the seven things that we have at the moment uh, is a tome on ancestral magics, um, tracing back to even before the Empire. Um, there is also um, uh, a one of our tomes on a potential prehistoric era. Uh, it's detailing the rise and fall of what is known as the Dragon Emperor. We aren't entirely sure of the verisimilitude of the, the book, of course, um, but the fact that it was taken seems very odd, um, considering we have not been able to verify whether it's fact or fiction. Um, there is a Codex of Divine Rituals that is mix missing. Um, one of our sacred texts dedicated to our praxis, but it also, of course, because it's praxis and he makes a gesture with his hand honoring our praxis as he says it uh it contains many rituals from many of the other religions to the to the various ascendant as well uh there was a book um listed as the hidden ciphers which is reputed to contain various coded messages and ciphers uh used not just by um the aegis battalions but also those from many of the various um armies of civilizations that um, that we have brought into the folds of the emperor, empire as, as well. Um, there is a, a Chronicles of the Eastern Realm, which I believe uh, is the most comprehensive record of the um, war, political, and key uh, events and key figures from um, the, the various uh, conflicts that arose on the Eastern uh, realms as the empire was growing. Um, there's... And he seems to, like, hesitate for a moment as he reads this and then he's been like looking up at Cassia every time he says these things but this time he does not look up and he says um, there is a tome uh, that we know to be fiction 
called The Secrets of the Illusion Society. Um, a, a book that is, of course, rumored to contain hidden knowledge about the Illusion Society and some of the inner workings and objectives of it over the, the centuries that it has existed. Um, and then he just kind of continues on, still without looking up. Uh, and he says, uh, and then there is a map of the Undercity the detailing uh, the various networks and tunnels and catacombs um, related to the inner workings of the city and um, the and he just kind of trails off for a second and you can tell that he's like running through all of these things in his head and he looks up at you with this seemingly heartfelt almost worried expression and says lady do you think that these were taken by the, those that are fomenting rebellion in the east Seemingly, seemingly is, clicking in his mind that all of these things would be useful to someone wishing to cause harm to the Empire. It is impossible to say with any certainty, although that speculation bears some scrutiny. This is indeed a grave matter. He kind of nods and sighs for a moment and just kind of shakes his head and looks at you and says what do we do now we've never we've never lost knowledge before we'll have to think about that knowledge is meant to be shared however and that is why our halls are open usually it isn't thieved but Perhaps those who took these needed them more than we do. He kind of nods. And... Oh, um, all right. Um, do we try to get them back? I think they are at their best here when they can be accessed by all who wish to find knowledge, so we should seek them out if we can. Right. Um, I can... Uh, do I do I take this to the, the Aegis Battalions? Do, do they investigate these sorts of things? Do we... Do we hand, I'm, I'm so sorry, I don't know. This is... What is the protocol of of losing knowledge. I don't know that there is any. This hasn't happened while I've been here. And I think we need to discuss this with the other seekers and see what they might have us do. Yes. Yes, of course that is, um, of course that's what we should do. Um, I shall call a, I shall call a, a conclave of the seekers then. And he just kind of hesitates and he's seemingly looking for some kind of reassurance. Always you you can tell a lost soul when you see one. I sort of lift his chin with my finger and look him make him look me in the eyes and say, It will turn out, Joram. Yes. It will. Thank you. I, I shall let you know immediately as soon as the conclave is called. And he kind of stammers and, you know, gestures to Apraxis um, and then turns and lets himself out of the, the chamber. Cassia sort of makes sure the door is closed and then just looks a little bit lost toward the things she she looks around her office but she doesn't see those things she's just thinking processing and taking in what she's just heard about all of this uh knowledge that has been taken all right as cassia is contemplating these things uh we will cut back to the, the final member of our group who 
uh, hopefully has settled on uh, an accent uh, at this point. Yes, I was thinking something like this. <laughs> oh, God. <laughs> uh. <laughs> Jeremy. Yes. Uh, so, we find ourselves uh, for Zorvir um, not in the capital of Indresca, not in Vastharis, not in any comfortable home that uh, anyone of the city might uh, expect us to be in, but rather we find ourselves high in the peaks of the mountains. So high, in fact, that it's impossible to tell exactly how high, as the only sight that you have from this peak to the ground below is blocked by clouds. And above these clouds, you have the perfect view of the brilliance of the twin suns that Ystera orbits. Their yellow and orange light just cascading uh, across this mountain peak with utter tranquility and significance. For an Arakakra, this is the epitome of where someone would want to be. So in this place that we are at, up above these peaks, as Zorvir is flying towards this peak, uh, about to descend into uh, the primary catacomb that leads down um, into the ancestral Ironwind estate. Please tell us, what does Zorvir look like? Uh, so he has some pretty brilliant red plumage um, that is starting to fade as he grows older. He's in his 50s as well. And uh, it's it's still healthy. It still looks vibrant, um, but it's for those that knew him years ago. It's definitely starting to fade, and he has some blue markings around his face. Uh, he's wearing a f kind of a matching color of blue, um, a trench coat that's uh, quite bright and um, almost seems to not ripple in the wind as he's flying almost like it's a uh some kind of um there's some kind of magic to it there's some gold embroidery on it um and as he swoops down and lands his uh unbooted feet clench the rock and he kind of squats for a moment something he would never do in the city uh and like kind of does the the three point superhero landing and his wings flap off some of the moisture from the clouds and he stands up and looks around um this is definitely a zorvir that people of the city would not ever see he would never be this uh let's say fluid with his movement in fact it's, it's kind of strange for him to be uh flying around these days as his job keeps him uh grounded yeah and this particular flight would obviously have been something that Zorvir had to plan out uh, at great length because the ancestral Ironwind estate uh, in these mountains is hundreds of miles from the capital. This is the kind of visit that perhaps Zorvir only does under um, the most extreme of circumstances just because it's so far away. And so as Zorvir uh takes in the the suns uh in this uh, panorama of colors uh, across the sky he turns and heads towards the the cavernous entryway leading down into the mountain itself uh he knows with each step that he takes it takes him closer and closer to uh the cradle where um, a clutch of aracocra eggs sits awaiting inspection this circumstance is one of the highlights of Zorvir's personal duties, not related to his professional ones back in the capital, something that uh, he very much enjoys, or at least did enjoy at some point. But this time there is an ominous feeling in, in Zorvir's mind as he descends down the perfectly carved stone and marble steps uh, that lead into the hatchery. Um, 
he makes his way down and a uh, woman, uh, an Eric Harper woman, um, steps out. Her her glistening uh, white feathers um, having a little bit of frost upon them because the temperature to keep uh, Eric Harper eggs uh, that's the reason that they're born so high up is they require very very low temperatures they take a decade sometimes to mature before they can be hatched um, and so she shakes off some of the cold condensation formed on her feathers and she regards Zorvir uh, and bows her head towards him this is Kendrasa a cousin uh, of Zorvir's whom he is known for well he is known since she was a hatchling and probably carries at least some measure of pride that this young hatchling that he helped to raise is now a clutch tender for the uh, the array of eggs that are to be born hopefully soon and I don't say anything I cross the chamber and um flick some final water droplets off my wings and walk up to her and uh, just put my like the the crown of my beak against hers and just close my eyes for a moment as we kind of uh, greet one another silently yeah um, as you stand there for and to a lesser mind what might have been an indeterminable amount of time but is in fact only you know, a few, a few short moments. Uh, she breathes a sigh of relief um, at your presence uh, and then steps back uh, and regards you um, and kind of cocks her head to, to one side and says, you're getting older. Uh, he doesn't say anything, but his eye, one eye opens a little bit wider and is the arc of his brow raises, he shakes his head um, and looks over at the eggs that are gathered. As you are standing in this elevated platform, you look out across the cavern where you see hundreds of Aarakocra eggs. The, the mist kind of rolling between them, the condensation keeping them uh, in the, the perfect state of temperature and comfortability to allow them to to grow and uh, eventually hatch um, and there is a, a serenity to this space it's almost like you can hear the music of the winds as they howl through the the various um, entryways into this chamber none of which are large enough for even like the smallest of crows to scurry their way into uh, not that a crow could even fly this high, but uh, it creates this um, this music, as as it were, that perhaps only Aarakocra can hear, and hopefully, from you and Kendrasa's perspective anyway, hopefully only Aarakocra ever hear, as this sacred place is one that no one else is ever allowed to be in. Um, I kind of jump off this ledge that I'm on and my wings spread out and I float down rather than flapping and land and I'm listening to the breeze move its way through and I kind of wave my hands over it in gesture and it shifts slightly at the nudges that I'm using my magic to push it slightly into a different tune um, and then I like close my eyes and tilt my head and listen to it and then satisfied I just glance up to see uh, where as you do this Kandrasa I need for is. you to make a in this case it would be a charisma saving throw please I think I could do that I hope so 27 yes you succeed um, as the, the music is shifting and as you're using your magic to subtly change it to alter the, uh, the note for this clutch of eggs to, in your mind, help them, you know, feel more at ease, the, the little tiny souls that are embedded in each of these eggs, 
there is a noticeable discordant twang in the music that ripples through you. You okay. find yourself in shock for a moment. You shake it off extremely quickly and it doesn't phase your attention. Uh, you maybe faltered for half a second uh, as this discordant note ripples uh, through your entire body uh, and you look about the room and you immediately know there is something wrong. There is an, an immediate sense of dread to you that something is wrong. So, glancing about, I just randomly, unless there's any visual sight that says otherwise, I randomly choose uh, eight eggs and I move about and I make these, these trilling noises in my throat and I touch each egg. And as I do, uh, it forges a, a mental link with each egg so I can try and feel what is going on inside. Uh, it's not necessarily a uh, communication, although that's what it would do should they be um, using telepathic bond to gotcha. connect with the eggs. Sure. Um, just to As, kind of feel yeah. what they're doing. Yeah. As Zorvir does this, he, with practiced ease, almost effortlessly uh, executes this bond uh, and starts reaching out to the minds uh, of these eggs in order to get a sense of what they feel. Because, like, an egg at this larval stage wouldn't be able to communicate in the same right. way, but they would have a mind, so they would be able to convey emotion and, and things like that. And he starts selecting his eggs, and then he's getting nothing. And it's not that there's nothing to come back. He's not even making a connection with his telepathic bond into the egg that he's chosen. And he moves to the next egg. And then he moves to the next egg, and the next, and the next, and the next. And he starts running through these and before he can finish casting the spell the magic of the spell wears away because he couldn't complete it in time with choosing even a single life to get a bond with and all at once despite that amazingly good charisma saving throw that you did there is an immediate overwhelming sense of dread that washes through Zorvir almost to the point of madness at the emotions that start welling inside of him as he comes to realize none of these eggs in his range are even close to being alive. He reaches down to cradle one of the eggs to, to feel the egg to know that it's real maybe this is all just some illusion maybe maybe he's not actually experiencing this and as his hand touches the egg the egg crumbles in his hand his hand devolves down into the, the carcasses of the egg itself and immediately he feels this ichor this vile black ichor as his hand disappears into the egg and he pulls his hand up and it is covered in this black ichor dripping down his talons and across the, the back of his arm down to his elbow it's spreading, it's growing out from this single egg it starts to envelop this entire chamber, it wraps around his ankles and starts coursing its way up across his own body he starts to panic as all of this starts to overwhelm him. It's coming closer and closer to his head. It starts to envelop his shoulders, his chest. He's unable to move his arms as it rises up and crosses uh, uh, into the uh, nape of his neck, moving up onto the crest of his skull. It starts to wrap around his face, starting to obscure his vision, starting to cover his beak, keep preventing him from even breathing in this moment as he just writhes in panic. And then you burst forth, you startle yourself awake, you sit up in your chair of your familiar office back in your in the capital, 
the office that you have been in for now what seems to be an eternity of your life. You jostle yourself awake, your heart is racing, your uh, chest is heaving from the panic of this nightmare that you just relived. And you sit there clutching your desk, the talons digging into this steel and stone and wood carving of your desk, just clutching it tighter than you've ever done anything before in your life. Your papers have now been scattered to the sides from your burst of becoming awake. And there you sit. And if anyone else were watching, there are other marks on the desk where this has happened before, but I take a moment. I take a moment and uh, calm myself, breathe, straighten my trench coat and like kind of brush off as though that icker were still there. Um, I rearrange my papers, I get up and I say the words that dim the, the magical lights in my office and uh, I end up going home to the estate that I have here with uh, my, my wife and my granddaughter. And when I get there, it's, it's very late at night and I expect them to be asleep. And so I, I go automatically just to go to my room, but something stops me and I, I turn right instead of going left. And I end up uh, in my wife's room instead. And it's been a long time since we've slept in the same chambers. Um, she's grown, uh, Others call it soft in the mind since the death of our sons, but uh, I just know that the the sorrow within her is more than she cares to show anyone else. And so I go in and she's asleep. And so I go in and almost touch her face, but then don't. I just kind of move my hand as though I were gently stroking her feathers and then I pull back. As you do this, you look over at her side table and you see the familiar sight of a small vial sitting next to, uh, sitting on the table next to the bed. One that you know contains a liquid that is meant to dull the senses to help one sleep through anything. Um, and something that you've probably been meaning to talk to her about. Yeah. But uh, not something that is an easy subject to broach. Right. And so um, I pick up the vial. Is it empty or is it? There's still there's still probably a dose or two left. Um, I'm just going to pocket that and take it with me. And then I will quietly leave her room and close the door and I walk back to my own room and I close the doors and I look around and uh, there are several lamps in here that are magical and I, I ignite one of them and then as you ignite go, the, the one lamp you see a familiar steel and gold encrusted letter sitting upon the table you know what's in it you haven't opened it you right. know what it is it's it's almost a formality that you know you get invited to these things but this one was different this one for some reason contained the seal of the emperor upon it meaning that you are his guest this quadrennial event and you're not entirely sure how to how to take that at this point but there it sits unopened and i'll look at it for a moment and my brain is still going, so I, I figure I better have some tea. And I, I do pull out that vial, and I glance at it for a moment and shake my head, and I'll, I'll just drop it in my trash bin. Uh, and I go over and make some tea, and then I just stop, and I grab, like, the entire tea set, and I just throw it across the room and it smashes against the wall and like winds begin to hurl around the room and tosses like the bed screeches as it's tilted over and you know pictures are ripping off the walls and there's just this like vortex of wind going around me 
and then it settles down and I just kind of as it crumple settles and cover myself with my wings as it settles down the camera hands away seeing Zorvir crumpling to the ground covering himself uh, the camera pans out enough to see at the doorway cracked just slightly ajar the vision of Zorvir's granddaughter staring at him and then we fade to black and that's where we're going to take our break ladies and gentlemen Are you kidding <laughs> golly so much happened <laughs> so quickly wow <laughs> God. Intense. Oh. Uh, we it was in the see. house. It wasn't in a tent. <laughs> no, bad. <laughs> bad, bad. Like I, was going, I, had to, I had to alleviate the. Yeah. <laughs> oh, I appreciate that. that. I appreciate that, Jeremy. <laughs> but I like going to break on those kinds of things. Anyway, <laughs> uh, we will be back in as close to five minutes as we can possibly bear. Uh, I hope all of you are enjoying this uh, this event that we have going on here. I certainly am. Uh, and we shall see you all again uh, very, very soon. Bye for now. Uh, welcome back, everyone. Uh, we are diving deep back into uh, the in our game here of Entresca's Rep Requiem. We just got done doing some very, very formidable introductions for all of our player characters, uh, not only for uh, all of you watching, uh, but for each other as well. We got to see some of the uh, ins and outs of perhaps uh, just a, a, a tiny tidbit of what our players have to offer us here with these amazing characters that they have created. But we are diving back in to uh, a little bit further forward in time to the Festival of Seal, a uh, quadrennial celebration that celebrates the unity, the prowess, and grandeur of the Empire. It is a, a vibrant holiday, um, eagerly awaited by pretty much every citizen of the Empire itself spanning five full days of continuous celebration held across every spectrum uh, of the Empire, uh, from the, the smallest uh, hamlet of a village all the way up to the grandiose capital city. Um, it holds special significance this time around uh, as it marks the 10th anniversary of the abolition of slavery, uh, an event fairly deeply ingrained in the collective memory of Entrescan society. And day one begins with the opening parade, a grand procession beginning at dawn uh, of particular note in Vastaris, the capital, because of just how massive in size the, the capital is. Um, but also, uh, this is kind of this is the heart of the empire, right? This is this is where the majority of not only the Aegis battalions, uh, but the Legionis are. Uh, and so the procession uh, starts with the resonating sounds of trumpets and drums as the armies of the Legionis and the battalions proudly donned in their polished carbon steel armor march across the uh, every road of Vestharis. Um, the canals that make up Vestharis, which the canals is the primary mode in which people can travel across such a massive city um the canals are basically filled uh end to stern uh with tiny tiny boats of people and some larger ones as well um down in the waters of the canal uh, as the processions march across every edge of every canal to the sounds of the trumpets and the drums uh, every boulevard is lined with people cheering the processions on. There are synchronized movements, uh, glowing armor, um, drums of war, uh, as it were, resonate the spectacle and power of the unity that the arms of the Empire present. It's a symbol of respect. Um, High-ranking officers uh, walking alongside the the regular uh battalion members um as on this day everyone no matter their rank within uh the military of intresca are equal 
they are all here to celebrate the honor that it is to serve the Entrescan Empire. This day is marked with a fair bit of feasting, but it's more along the lines of the various food carts and, you know, merchants uh, that get to take advantage of a greatly increased volume of business, we'll say, uh, and less, less about, like, festive meal gatherings and the like. There are, of course, you know, neighborhoods with, you know, their version of a block party where everybody comes down with, you know, a little bit of food and and wine and, and celebrates uh, alongside each other, waiting for the, the Legionis to march you know, alongside their particular um, their street. Uh, but it's, it's a very, very poignant beginning to a five-day celebration as it shows the true honor and power of the Empire. Day two is referred to as the Forged Masters. It's a day that commences with a series of anvil choruses echoing across the skit the city there are many uh, such places within um, the capital in particular in which skilled artisans from pretty much every corner of the empire uh, gather um, they haul their various anvils out to the streets themselves pounding upon them with their hammers in rhythmic patterns creating a, a symphony as the crowds of people roam across the city seeing open air exhibitions, pardon me, of, of uh, intricately forged weapons, armor, uh, artistic sculptures, uh, as it were, as well. Um, anything that can be crafted through skill and hand, uh, people get to see and bear witness to showing off the, the might of Entrescan, Entresca's forges and the artisans that are trained in the Empire. Day three then comes to the Arcane Revelry, a dazzling display of magic that uh, begins as the sun comes up and doesn't end until the suns come up on the following day. Um, there isn't much sleep on day three, uh, and sometimes people can't wait for day four because they get to take in some much needed and deserved rest on such a day after such a day as the arcane revelry pyrotechnic displays and enchantments mages from various academies particularly those of the empyrean vanguard uh, show up uh, exhibiting their control over not only the elements but also magic of war sending fireballs and other displays uh, into the sky uh, to streak across and impress everyone. Uh, it is such a cacophony of bloom of light in the sky that even the most um, reserved of individuals can't help but gasp in amazement from the crowd as they see these various displays of magic. The main event of this day, however, takes place just before the setting suns uh, at a magical dueling tournament where mages test their skills one another in various specially prepared arenas throughout the city. Um, every now and then you'll get some of these uh, duels that take place in the streets, some of them prompted, or some of them unprompted, some of them scripted uh, to, you know, catch the attention of people and, and whatnot. Um, but it is not without merit that every now and then someone ends up in um, the hospital being tended to by events that take place on this day and not always people that were part of duels. Sometimes these magics are a little hard to control and you might get caught a little bit too close to the heat, so to speak, as it were. But that leads us into the fourth day. Previously, historically, this fourth day has been one of rest, where the various uh, religious groups and organizations within the Empire gather and walk the streets offering prayers and hymns and song uh, to bolster the people and giving them the opportunity to kind of recuperate from the previous three days. But this one is a little bit different. On this day, fourth day of the celebration, uh, or the festival, we get to celebrate emancipation, um, a solemnity 
of, as the city and the empire remembers its past. Um, various bronze monuments depicting freed slaves breaking their chains uh, are set up at gathering points where speeches and performances uh, recount um, the various difficulties of life for those that were once slaves. Anyone that knows of the true history of how all of this was to be is definitely not quite as perhaps um, honored by some of these events. They know that these are glorifications of an event that has left uh, a mark upon the Empire itself. I, of course, leave it to all of you to decide for yourselves how your characters actually feel about this particular unique day compared to all of the previous um, days of the Festival of Steel that you have encountered. But at the very least, the very end of the day is one of solemnity in which candlelit vigils are held in the evening to remember those who suffered under the yoke of slavery. And even in those moments, without the pomposity and the grandiosity that took place early in or earlier in the day, even the most jaded of individuals can recognize that there was an element to what transpired that was very, very bad. And hopefully, the shaping of the future of the Empire can come with some good as a result of all of it. But that leads us into the fifth day. The grand feast. The city wakes up to the delicious smell of food being prepared in every household across the city. Streets are filled with long tables laden with an array of dishes uh, that showcase the diversity of the culinary arts of Entresca. Um, every different culture that has been absorbed into uh, Entrescan society as a result of the expansion of the empire is presented here, even in the capital city, which is predominantly, you know, what some might refer to as true Entrescans, born before, you know, much of the, or who have family lineages that trace back to well before the birthing of the empire and all of these various cultures that came into it. Um, even here, there is a diversity of everything that you see. Laughter, music fill the air. People, irrespective of social status, share food and stories and dance together. And simultaneously, there are many, many, particularly here, private banquets that are held in grand mansions and, and estates where elites gather to host lavish feasts with delicacies reserved for only the most special of occasions. And it's at one of these such events that we find all of you. As you find yourselves in the royal halls, a, pardon me, excuse me. The royal halls mark themselves in particular as a place of notoriety in the capital city as very, very few people ever get to see the insides of them. That is compared to the many, many hundreds of thousands of people that live in the capital. You find yourselves in this grand hall in the capital, in the emperor's, or on the emperor's estate, this grand royal celebration before you, the archways of this grand hall lined with perhaps a thousand people in total, um, an immense celebration. Every possible dish that you could want you can find in the various alcoves of this place. It's standing room only for the most part throughout it, although for those that have attended uh, events such as this, they can very easily recognize um, the various cliques that have formed, various groupings of individuals that uh, are making their way uh, together. Um, and as you are individually or with your own small entourage of people making your way across to, uh, this various uh, celebration off in the distance you do see the emperor 
um, standing uh, at the far end with a secondary throne that has been built into the space just for him because, well, he's the emperor and he can request such things. And there's not a damn thing that any of you can do about it. <laughs> um, and across this way, music playing, echoing across the, the various halls, banners streaking in the, in, uh, the, the dimming light uh, of the, the night sky as the suns are starting to set magical lanterns taking the place to keep uh, the various parts of the chamber illuminated. Where do we find you, Beth, amongst this cacophony of celebration? <clears throat> well, um... Barrick would be doing his best to stand uh, hey, on sort of... finally got it. Hey, nice. Oh, that's cool. Um, he, he'd be making sure to stay sort of on the outskirts of this enormous group of people. Um, you'd see once again that he has just pristine posture, which um, most would just assume it's because of his status, but um, Meryl knows it's because he is very uncomfortable uh, in this setting. Um, but he would make the small talk necessary and shake the hands that need to be shook and uh, just try his best to make his way through without um, too much fanfare. All right. Did Meryl join you for this one? Yes. Okay. Yeah. Um, she's probably m a little bit more comfortable in yeah. these kinds of events, but she probably sticks close to you to make sure the, to try to provide you with a, a little aid to that comfort. Um, Deb, where do we find Cassia amongst this sea of people? I'm not on the edges, but I'm also not in the middle. I think I'm uh, kind of being propelled from one group to the next as uh, I'm fairly well known by a lot of different people and they all kind of want to talk to me and introduce themselves or introduce other people that they know. And so I'm sort of moving around uh, kind of in a big circle around the center of the room. All right. Do, is Cassia accompanied by an entourage from um her temple i think she came by herself okay and what about acris ian this being the first such event that acris has attended in the royal halls where is he i think acris is being unintentionally pushed between person to person not that he's lost in the crowd. It's more so of uh, people coming up and them introducing themselves and like ooing and eyeing and, and oh, we've heard this about you. Oh, we've heard that. And I guess <clears throat> as opposed to when he was at Barrick and Merrill's house, um, he was more comfortable there. Um, he's He's got this air about him that this is game time, right? He's He's pretty focused on making sure that he upholds an appearance that I'm supposed to be here but in his mind he's like I don't like, there's so many people talking to me I just don't it's a little bit overwhelming right now and he's like caught in between a conversation of people speaking about the empire and how structural integrity and things like that and they're just they're talking and he's sitting there and he's just like absolutely yeah no I think okay yeah and he's looking past these people and he's he's looking for Meryl specifically and he's just like oh, okay uh wonderful yeah no i'll see i'll see you later in the evening trying to like uh kind of get out of the conversation all right and zorvir or jeremy where is zorvir uh zorvir is also just moving from group to group um having come from a family of uh renowned 
initially anyway, even before rising in the government as he has. And so these parties are not, uh, maybe, maybe like an emperor party is a little bit higher than he tends to go to, but these parties are not anything new. And so he's just, uh, walking between them, talking about whatever is the latest thing. Uh, he's showing off a scar he got on day, what was, which day was the day two is the day with the, the, the fighting. That the, was day three. Day three, okay, yeah. so he was uh, doing some, some fencing during day three and uh, got nicked like on his face, just beneath his eye. And of course, rather than healing it with magic, he like healed it enough but left the scar um, and you know he's reenacting the fight and and all of that so he's definitely uh, loud and boisterous and can be heard within yards sure nice and Develian Develian glides his way through the crowd he definitely has the same air about him that he is used to dealing with with these places. As he moves through the crowd, he's actually going to reach and he's just going to very casually pull a wine glass off of the tray of someone nearby, like a servant or something. He's got one in his one hand, but he grabs this other one and he is looking forward. He moves up to the individual that he was going to be approaching. And as he approaches um, Cassia, who he's only known through reputation, he does not know her yet. He says in Elven, good evening. Could you imagine that such a sight as this room could be put upon people such as ourselves. It is quite a sight. I don't believe we've met before. We certainly have not. I will offer her the wine glass that I just pulled off of that tray. I'll take it. I am Develian of House Illustriel, and I welcome you. I don't believe I have seen you here before, but I did wish to converse with you if you are in such a mood. That is fine. I'm Cassia Ortezi. Well, well met. If my knowledge of the religious bouts here within the city do not doubt me, I believe you are perhaps tied into the faith of Alprexus, correct? That is correct. Hmm. Well, I wanted to perhaps speak to you about the strange activity that I heard about on your campuses there. It would seem that something went missing some weeks ago. Rather dastardly, from what I understand. We did have an unfortunate uh, incident where a few of our materials went missing. Hmm. Well, nothing drastic, I hope. Nothing super important. All knowledge is important, of course. Well said indeed, and I hold up my wine glass and a salute. I tend to think that every decision, every course, and every thought that we have is uber important to the utmost, the final outcome of all. But what I wish to perhaps ask you about, though, is this information that was lost. Uh, do you perhaps know where it might have gone? We've been investigating, but there's nothing beyond that that I have the liberty to say at this time. Mm, very smart. Well, the rumors that I have heard amongst my circles is that it has been a damned rebellion of sorts, is sneaking and skulking about, grabbing up things that they believe that they need, whether they be items or books or whatever it is that you store there. Uh, people, even from what I understand, would see that there are certain individuals who have disparaging thoughts about the Empire. And where did you come across that information? Well, I hear all sorts of things upon my social endeavors. I am I'm too sure not liberty to tell. <laughs> but have you heard anything about this rebellion? Do you put any stock in such a thing? Oh, there's always talk here and there going around. Mm. Time will tell whether this is any different. Mm, certainly shall. So, you don't have any personal opinions about it at all, then? You simply believe that your faith was at the wrong place at the wrong time, as these humans say. I think people were in search of knowledge, and they know where to find it. Indeed. 
Well, perhaps we should uh, move our discussions to more jovial terms. Have you seen this chandelier? And I point up. I believe it goes back to the beginning of the Empire, since the royal family, and I'll trail off into something as we cut into another part of the, the crowd, okay. perhaps. If I could, I think in that moment, coming in and out of conversations, uh, Acris, like, accidentally backs up into Devellian, kind of, like, jostling his drink a little bit. He turns around and he goes, uh, he's like, oh, oh I'm, I'm very sorry about that. I, I, I hope I didn't spill. Are, are you okay? Oh, I'm certainly fine. There is a uh, slight gesturing of my fingers, of my open hand, and the uh, little bit of wine that was spilled upon my lapel just instantly disappears off of it. I'm and, certainly fine. What might your name be, young man? I believe you are new here as well to me. Oh, uh, very much so. Um, my name is uh, Akris Shurjong, and he kind of gives like a like, little bow. Hmm. This is the last name of perhaps I have heard before, is it not? Uh, yeah. My, uh, my family has been of service to the Empire, as we all are, for quite some time. Of course. Dutiful and kind to members of the Empire, to be doubt, no doubt. Absolutely. Um, might I ask, if I could, just from your uh, attire, are you military? No, I am not, unfortunately. Although there are members of my family that are. I also, like yourself and like your parents before you, I serve the Empire openly and with great trust and honor. I am Develian of House Elistriel. I am currently third in line to the Elven throne that is of somewhat lesser renown to the Empire's throne, of course. I would never begin to put myself upon any sort of pedestal up above the Empire. His graciousness beams across us all. But I simply, yes, I have a presence here. I have been known to mingle amongst the masses, as it were, and I'd like to know everyone who is about. Uh, hearing Elvin, if it wasn't already noticeable, um, Acris in Elvin gives a proper greeting towards uh, Devellian, and in that moment kind of jerks his head and he sees Cassia and he goes, Cass! Uh, Cassia, how are, how are you doing? Because that's the reason how he learned Elvin was from Cassia. How, how are I'm you? well. Thank you, Akris. How are you enjoying your first festival? Um, it's a lot to behold. It it definitely is, but um, I'm very happy for the opportunity to be here. Also, I think Cassia knows that I didn't accidentally bump into Devellian. That was on purpose. For sure. <laughs> <laughs> um, how are you enjoying even? I I know that you've been to many of these. I have, you know, they sort of all blend together, but this one is special in various ways. Wonderful. Well, I probably should have talked or spoken to you before this. Maybe you could have given me some uh, best pointers on how to navigate all of this. It's a lot of people talking about a lot of things uh, for no apparent reason. Sometimes what? all you need to do is just nod and smile. I've noticed. <laughs> that that is certainly very true. You have the way about it yourself. Might I also humbly suggest that you look up rather than down at your feet when you move about? It helps to not perhaps bump into others and waste great and rather expensive wine. <laughs> I do apologize. Uh, coming from where I'm from, looking at your feet makes sure you maintain your ground as opposed to the hot air in the crowd. Do you not trust your step where you walk from? Is your ground so trepidatious that you do not know where your foot may land? Uh, I think the closer I focus on to where I'm walking, the less opportunity that I have at pompous delusions. Hmm. And at this point, Develian's eyes have actually turned away from these two. He's listening still, but he looks over and he actually sees uh, Barrack across the way a bit, and he's watching him. Um, I would like to hope that it's not enough that these two are like, what is he watching him for? But he's definitely watching him, noticing him. Oh, no, Barrack can, can handle themselves. <laughs> Anyone watching Barrack, it's, <laughs> it's, I'm more so worried about the person who's watching. Oh. <laughs> and, and while Devellian's like making eyes at Barrack, you, you hear a shout through the crowd. Devellian! Devellian Illustriel! 
my attention. You scoundrel. The, the crowd, How dare the you crowd, show your face here? The crowd parts in the space in between the source of the voice and Develian himself. I turn see, my eyes narrow for a moment as I, I look to see who's speaking that way to me. You see Zorvir standing there, hand on, like, the the hilt of his rapier. Hmm. I look at my wine for a moment, and I actually hand it to Acris. I don't take it. I just kind of look down <laughs> at it. <laughs> yeah, I don't take it. But he doesn't take it. I just walk, and as I walk, I'll just hold it out, and some servant will take it out of my hand as I move, <laughs> as I don't even look at them. And I will cross half the distance between Zorvir and myself. Yes, you have gotten my name, friend. Perhaps I should be kind to have be given yours. As you walk, so does Zorvir, and we meet in the middle, and I eye you. And even though you're a little taller than I am, my wings are like jutting above, and therefore I, I seem to have this looming presence. And I kind of loom over you for a moment. And then my arms shoot out, I pull you into hug, and I like slap your back. And I'm like, it's so good to see you. It's been years since we've had the chance to drink together. It has indeed, old friend. It has indeed. And I will actually hold my hand back out, and that same servant runs across and hands me back that glass. <laughs> and I bring it back across. I put a reassuring hand on Zorbir's shoulder. Tell me, how goes things in your neck of the woods here? Oh, I things are by doing... sooner, but I had to deal with the uh, irascible Lord Prumbo. I believe you know uh, him as well. Unfortunately, too well. Uh, yes. things are, things are, you know, managing. I'm, I'm getting by these days. Uh, uh, mm -hmm. I, I can't seem to remember what my wife's name is right at the moment. Wow. <laughs> <laughs> While you're trying to think of your wife's name, yeah. Eric, uh, nudges Meryl and is like, I, I genuinely thought they were going to fight for a moment. <laughs> Acris looks fun. at Cassie and be like, are you sure he wasn't going to stab thing? <laughs> <laughs> Meryl uh, just looks at looks at Beric and is just kind of rolls her eyes and pats him on the shoulder and is like, "Don't worry. One day when you grow up, you'll get to read things correctly." <laughs> <laughs> he loves it. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, Zervir begins telling you about his his current projects and such and. Uh, Viren has been uh, laid up at home for some weeks, but she seems to be doing better. And uh, Arentha, Arenthia is has been taking care of her. She's my granddaughter. Um, yeah, the conversation kind of heads that way. Mm -hmm. What is um, Devalian's passive insight? My passive insight? Me whip this up here. My passive insight is a tw uh, 11. 11? I thought it was higher than that. 11. Okay. He, Develian is too full of himself to pick up on the, the subtle hints of like Zorvir's statements and tone that reflect there's definitely a lot more going on there than, than uh, is coming through in just the words. But, you know, Develian doesn't care about that. He's too full of himself to, to really care. Certainly. I think that the two of us go over and I will recommend that we find a more quiet corner. Uh, it is a bit loud and bustly out here and I'll find maybe like there's a, a corner where we can stand, have a little bit more of a conversation. Oh, to, most, uh, I actually have a, a private uh, table over here if you want oh. to go. Excellent. Well, I will follow your lead then, friend. And lead him over. There's like a, an area with alcoves that you can like draw curtains sit in there and oh, like my wings relax <laughs> and I'm like, oh, it's so tiring walking around these things. It certainly is. I could only imagine, of course, I have not been gifted with the skill of flight such as yourself. If only these were uh, held in the skies, I would do so much better. Uh, how about you? I'd spin, it's been some some time before we've been able to sit and have a conversation. It has been quite a while. 
I have found myself and my continued presence here, and I have been living it up, as the humans would say. I have been making sure that my presence is known here, and uh, actually I was just meeting some of the local wildlife. You would not believe the fact that uh, I, for the first time as long as I could remember, I had to actually use magic right here in the courts to make sure that my presence was upkept. Prestidigitation goes a long way to making sure that one is presentable for the Emperor. Ah, uh, yes, you definitely don't want to shake hands with him with mustard on your sleeve. No, certainly not. Um, but yes, the uh, there's a lot going on about the city. Uh, surely in your travel, tell me, what have you learned about this mysterious rebellion that I hear so much about? It is all the rage in the circles that I sit in. We play our long card games, our dragon chess matches, and all we talk about, well, all they talk about, I should say, are that this is damned rebellion that's going to destroy the empire, it's going to change everything forever. Can you believe such a thing so small and pitiful could do such a thing? Oh, I wouldn't worry yourself too much about it. I think it's just uh, the, the latest fad to complain about these things that people aren't even on the front lines to understand. <laughs> I believe we are of like mind, friend. Yes, I was having to calm down some of my contingents to uh, let them know that the Aegis Battalion itself is not necessary to quell such a small and unkept group of people, but who knows what will happen with time. But I must say, the Emperor, ah, blessed be his name, I look around real quick, um, he was not entirely supportive of the aid that your family needed in the time after the death of your sons. Um, surely you have been dealing with that properly. You do not still hold the resentment against the Empire as you did in those times? No, no. I, I, I would say that uh, I wasn't quite in my right mind during those days. And, you know, getting back into work right away, I think it really did help me more than I thought it would. Uh, obviously, my wife still needs some time. She she took the loss of our sons very hard, but uh, we have we have our granddaughter to think about, and uh, you know, let's not let's not dwell on these things. Why don't we go back to the party? And uh, I saw that there was uh, they were they're going to be bringing out some of those delightful uh, what do you call them? The little uh, the little crustaceans that. They come with the cocktail sauce. Oh, yes. That's the pre-cooked shrimp that are still cold. Yes. They have that delightful red sauce upon them. It is a delicacy from the West, from what I understand, but I do enjoy it rather so. Yes, let us go and do that, friend. And I will stand. I will empty that wine glass that I have. I just set it down and leave it on the whatever nearby thing that it is. And, uh, yeah, we'll head off into the crowd to go find some shrimp. All right. Yes, yeah, shrimp uh, cocktail. As the, uh, the two... Um, <laughs> eldest and most pompous of our entourage here make their way across uh, in search of shrimp cocktail. Uh, where do we find Cassia and uh, uh, Acris after the notable individual left their presence? I, um, I think after Devillian kind of walked away, Acris looks over and goes, uh, uh, Cass, I heard that they're that somebody had stole some books from from you guys. Is, is everything okay? But... We are still investigating, uh, but yes, there were a number of tomes and uh, important works that were taken from our halls. Wow. That's never happened before. No. From, from what I know. Yeah. No. Not as long as I've been with with them, so... Well, I mean, you're more than capable, and I'm sure it'll all turn up, or you'll figure it out as you do. Yes. As I said to the others, that perhaps those who took the information needed it more than we do. You don't think it's like, and he kind of makes air about it, you don't think it's like this, oh, it's people from the rebellion stealing information. <sighs> That's what some others think, I can't say. As you're talking, uh, Meryl will drag Beric uh, 
into the throng of people, um, but very fortunately directly towards you, Acris, which is uh, a bit of a relief. Um, <clears throat> good evening. Evening. How's that shoulder? <sighs> Fine. Thank you. <laughs> um, and I, we haven't met, my lady. Um, I'm Beric. Um, this is this is Meryl. I know who you are. <laughs> You're well talked about around these parts. He doesn't know what to do with that. He'll he'll just nod. Meryl just kind of clears her throat and says, "Well, anyone on the Orm Council would be talked about, I assume." I think you're right. Uh, Cassie, as much as I owe um, my expansive knowledge and your help with uh, my studies, I would say that I owe the same to Beric in, um, what would you call it? Daily self-defense, right, old man? <laughs> sure. <sighs> if that's what yeah. you call two men getting sweaty in a backyard and... At this point, Meryl kind of drifts over to, to Cassia a little bit and, like, <laughs> extend a hand to, you know, exchange formal introductions between the two of them while Beric and Acris, um drone on about fighting. <laughs> <laughs> Hello, I'm Cassia. Pleasure to meet you. Um, I don't think you would remember this but uh i attended a uh, lecture that you gave uh, about a year ago as it were within um within your halls and i must say you had some very astute observations on the premises of the way in which our society has changed over the past three centuries with the growth of the empire i'm curious what you think now that the expansion is over with and in these intervening years since the expansion was concluded what that bodes for our future i think our future is bright as always uh, these are however turbulent times uh, any big changes within an empire will of course create some uh, unease and unrest among the population but i think that uh we have a promising future ahead of us. Indeed. I am most interested in what the next generation will bring. And of course, for us, and she kind of gestures to Beric, um, that next generation is far sooner than perhaps yours. And, well, it, um, it makes me feel comforted to know that a wise individual such as yourself will still be here to lead the next generation of ours. I think the next generation will have their own ideas and who can say what they will come up with. Indeed. And as this is happening, like the rest of the party is still ongoing. Like the, this is the this is the kind of event that you show up at and then you know that you have to be here for at least three hours before you can you know say that you know you've been here long enough and politely excuse yourself uh, and that sort of thing so the amount of wine and food that is being consumed is tremendous and uh, the number of people you know it's it becomes a veritable cacophony where it at times is difficult to even hear the person that you're conversing with but for several of you, uh, I think most of you, in fact, who have some exceedingly amazing perceptions, um, I think Zorvir caps it off at passive of 26? Yeah, that sounds about right. Yeah. God. <laughs> but I think our lowest is like... Oh, wait. Actually, I don't know. Acris, what's Acris's passive perception? He might have the lowest. 13? Yeah. That's the, that's definitely the lowest, um, which is still good by comparison to most people, uh, in fact. Uh, but when someone else in the in the party has double it, 
Um, they're definitely going to be picking up on things that perhaps uh, Acris is not. But there's all kinds of conversations that are taking place. As has been implied from the excellent roleplay that you have had here, there's quite a bit of discussion taking place about the rebellion and what it means and the tensions that it's causing and that sort of thing. That's virtually on everyone's tongue uh, at this point. But you also pick up on a few different conversations as well that seem to be implying, as there's a lot of discussion about it, the topic of slavery and how it has had a disastrous effect upon the Empire. And some of those talking circles are talking about it in terms of the abolishment is the disaster. Some of them are talking about it in terms of the existence of the Empire being built on slavery was a disaster. Um, and in the end, I would say that particularly you, Jeremy, um, pick up at some point in some noble circle or another as he's kind of just drifting by, wishing that he could be flying through the chamber. Although the last time he th flew through a chamber such as this, it didn't go over particularly well. Um, he's able to drift by a conversation between a bunch of nobles uh, in which someone makes a rather, from his mind anyway, a astute observation that uh, the abolishing of slavery didn't end slavery. It just turned people into paupers. And surely that has an effect on society, doesn't it? And of course, you know, that gets blown over very quickly by a bunch of pompous nobles that, you know, kind of ugh, guffaw at you know, such a, a trivial thing that, you know, people should be happy that they're not slaves anymore and they can find jobs. There's plenty of jobs to be had in the empire and all of this sort of thing. Um, and as you all continue throughout this space, you frequently find yourselves be getting drug into various conversations. Um, and Beric, you find yourself getting drug into a conversation that most certainly you did not want to get drug into, um, but also with a very notable individual. As Beric is making his way throughout the chamber, not realizing just how close he comes to the constructed throne of the Emperor, uh, he hears his name rung out. Beric, come here. Settle this dispute, please, as Lord Emperor Geronton stands up from his throne, pushing aside whatever noble he was speaking to uh, in that moment, basically to the point that the man almost falls off of the dais, um, barely catching himself, mostly being caught by, you know, a couple of the servants that are always in proximity to the Emperor. Uh, as he descends down from the dais himself, heavy footfalls from his very, very impressive form. He fixes the golden green gloves uh, upon his hands in front of them, tightening them and clenching his fist as he does as he approaches you. Um, even with Beric's not amazing passive insight, but good enough, um, he knows when the Emperor is in a mood, and he can tell quite clearly that if this conversation doesn't go well, something bad could very well happen. As the Emperor descends down the steps and locks Beric in place, what does Beric do with his name ringing out and basically silencing this thousand-person chamber? of noise to where a pin drop could be heard upon the floor. Beric will take this summons and walk directly up to the Emperor, uh, stand at attention in front of him, and um, just say, yes, Lord Emperor. As a member of the Aethon Council, as one of the prime scepters in which I request often guidance for military strategy and policy, I need you to explain to me, good sir, why it is 
that all I am hearing about is this fucking rebellion. Why have we not dispatched the Legionis to destroy this circumstance? This lord, and he gestures at the man that he tossed, who is a familiar face in one that we had recently, a couple of weeks back, had a conversation with Develian, implies that we should have done this weeks ago. How is it that this buffoon seems to know more than a scepter? Lord Emperor, I have always admired your indomitable spirit, and I support your desire to display the might of the Orum Legionis uh, when it comes to this rebellion. Nevertheless, I believe that in this case, employing a more calculated strategy would yield the best results. And what calculated strategy would you recommend? Scepter. <clears throat> Lord Emperor, uh, I would propose sending in a, a smaller expeditionary force. Um, that way we could locate the rebel leadership, maybe acquire some intelligence that would be needed to identify and target any additional outposts and exploit the rebels' vulnerabilities. With that information, the Legionists could coordinate attacks and, and we could end the rebellion in one fell swoop. It would be an unanticipated maneuver that would show just how formidable Entresca's power is. Sir. Roll a persuasion check for me, please. I'm gonna die. Seventeen? There is a palpable silence throughout this cavernous space. Someone coughs, and then you hear the thud of someone like punching them in the back to get them to shut up from having an uncontrolled outburst such as that. It was Develi in the coffin, and I'm the one who... <laughs> <laughs> no, no, it was it was some buffoon. Yeah, probably not. Um, <laughs> Develian. <laughs> <laughs> no. Uh, and the Emperor stands there just staring at Beric, and this is something Beric is used to, right? He knows, having been in the presence of uh, Geranton, when he is in this kind of state, that the best thing that you can do is not wilt. Because the moment that you wilt is the moment that he destroys you. It, there has been more than an, a, a single scepter in the time that Beric has been on the council that have lost their position, their wealth, their status, and even their life to wilting in front of the Lord Emperor. And so as Beric is standing there, staring into these soft, glowing, almost uh, opalescent eyes of the Emperor, a smile cracks upon his face. And in that moment, a bead of sweat drops down off of Beric's forehead as he realizes that he's not going to be one of those individuals from history at this moment. And as he smiles, he says, Very well, Scepter. I will send you then. You will have one Centaurian, you will have one Century, and you will have your own entourage. And then he kind of starts looking around the room and sees the various people that are just staring at him agape in this moment, at this situation. And he cracks a smile that Beric recognizes, one of viciousness one in which the Lord Emperor is, has made a decision in his mind that people just will not be able to expect. And he points. Firstly, he points at Cassia, seeing her gathered in this space. You will attend, Lord Beric. And then he just kind of very quickly moves on to the next individual, and he spots... Uh, Acris 
and you. And then he turns again, and he seems to be kind of looking about the room at anyone that catches his eye. He sees Develian standing there, and an even broader smile comes across his face. And he says, with seeming a drip of venom off of his tongue, he says, and you, Develian, you can walk the shadows in this one and go as well. And then he rests his eyes upon Zorvir. And something that only Beric can see at this point, because Jurantan is sometimes hard to read, sometimes quite easy, but Beric has the most experience amongst the rest of you in witnessing these sorts of things. And as Jurantan looks at Zorvir, Beric sees hatred, not anger that he sees so often with the Lord Emperor but hatred at the sight of this Arakakra. And you, taxman, you will go too. And so he, had actually been like working his way up to try and save this poor soldier person <laughs> uh, with some well-intended suggestions. And so when he's called out, uh, he just stops and looks around. Of course. And the Emperor turns on his heels and starts storming away from the entire celebration, making his way towards an exit, a trail of servants following after him, a few hangers-on people with ostensibly the ear of the Emperor trying to catch up and understand what just happened. As the fire, yes, as the five of you kind of stare at each other, for a long moment, familiar vaguely with one another as you have been called out so randomly by the whims of the Emperor to apparently go off with a century of uh, the Aegis Battalion's finest men to go and quell the rebellion that seems to be vexing Durantan's day. And that's where we're going to call it for tonight. God. Juicy. Out of a thousand nice. people, huh? <laughs> right? <No mods. laughs> oh, God. How did that happen? I mean... <laughs> Meryl, this is why I don't go to these things. <laughs> guys, I walk up to you, I'm like, so, what uh, What exactly did you just get us into? <laughs> right? I think, I, I think Acker stumbles up to him and goes, what the hell was that? Right? <laughs> I just got here. <laughs> oh, if I had an answer. Come on. <laughs> so, yes, uh, thank you, everyone, for uh, staying with us uh, on this uh, glorious uh, premiere event for this eight-part series of Entresca's Requiem. Uh, I am so happy to get to share more of my homebrew world of Eastera with all of you, and I am so extremely happy that I get to have this amazing group of players uh, tell this story uh, with me and for me. Um, we're going to uh, go around and uh, do some uh, outroductions, as it were. Uh, let everyone uh, know who you are, where you can be found, things that you like to do, things that you want to promote. Uh, yeah, go off. Do what you like. Beth, you're up first. Wow, so much power that you've given me now. Um, oh, I can take it away, Dory. Oh, darn. <laughs> so fleeting. Um, I am Beth. Uh, tonight I played Beric, the uh, soldier, military strategist, guy who's getting everyone in trouble. Um, and uh, I had so much fun role playing with everyone today. This was just the best. Um, you can find me on social media at Beth Masco. Um, you can find me here on the Wanderer's Haven channel doing all kinds of stuff coming up. Um, I'm working on something fun, so we'll see how that goes. TBD. Uh, and Is it pink? It, in it might be pink. Mm -hmm. It mm -hmm. might be mm -hmm. pink involved. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, so good stuff coming. Um, but I just want to say thanks to uh, all you fun players for really just knocking it out of the park here 
indeed, indeed. Deb, let's pass. Let's pass the baton of power Great. over to Deb. Yes, I'm Deb. I played Cassia, the uh, cleric in the Church of Apraxis. Um, man, what a game. I'm so excited to see where this is going. Uh, this is an incredible group of folks to play with. So thanks for inviting me to the table. Um, I am on Instagram at DSweats, and uh, you can see pictures of a couple of goofy cats and some other stuff, uh, baked goods, things like that. Um, I've been, this is my second game with Wanderer's Haven. I have also played over at Superior Adventurer's Guild a couple times, so um, I'm here and there. Cool, cool. And you are not a man from Texas. No. <laughs> There's a story. That is very true. Nope. <laughs> Never actually been to Texas, so. Wait a minute. You're not missing that much. <laughs> Darn. Uh, plot twist. Plot twist. <laughs> I'll, I'll, I'll tell you that story after we uh, we close that out. Speaking of closing it out, let's continue to pass the baton. <laughs> Ian, my friend, good sir, please convey to everyone all of the awesomeness that is Ian. Hey, everybody. Uh, my name is Ian. I am a man from Texas. So that's where I'm at now. Um, you can find me on all social media, mostly on Twitter for all of my TTRPG stuff at your boy big, which is Y A B O I B I G. And of course, I will be here next week playing this lovely game that Miko has so graciously provided us the opportunity to do, which is awesome, by the way. Um, on uh, Sundays, you can uh, see me over in the Magic RPG channel playing their second season of their Icewind Dale campaign where I play a tiefling bard that just gets into a lot of trouble. Uh, also on Sundays too, not this one, but next Sunday, I'll be on Times Lord Life channel playing uh, their Dragon Rider campaign where we should be getting our dragons pretty soon. Super excited about that. And most recently and most new that I'm uh, very excited about is that I am part of an actual play podcast called uh, Emergent Code, where we play a Digimon inspired um, world. And uh, the primer is out now on all podcast uh, platforms, but the premiere episodes come out tomorrow. So definitely make sure you uh, hit up my Twitter and uh, see that when that drops. Nice. nice. You guys Maybe def- you can go hang out with the D sweats that lives in Texas. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> yeah, I need to hear that story. <laughs> oh, I'll tell you guys after we're done. I'll tell you guys after we're done. You guys should definitely check out Ian. He's got some awesome stuff. That Dragon Rider, yeah. that Dragon Rider game is fucking stellar, man. Props nice. to you in that. You're amazing in that. I am so happy that you accepted my invitation to uh, to be part of this because I can't see anyone pulling off a character like Acris like you can, dude. It's amazing. You, again, you are too kind. <laughs> you are too kind. <laughs> Jeremy. Uh oh. Who are you? Uh-oh. How did how did you get here, by the way? You know, <laughs> it's weird because I was drinking and then I woke up here and I don't even know where this is, so <laughs> uh hi, I'm Jeremy. I live here on this Twitch channel. Uh you can follow me on Twitter at WH Pubs, or you can over to head over to whpublications.com to see my publications. Uh what else? Uh, I'm going to let Kevin cover some of the stuff going on this weekend, but stop by on Saturday at 9 p.m. Eastern for the premiere of Ashland, which is a uh, 2D20 system uh, creator content world. Is that what it's called? Uh, like by Troy Mepius. I can never, I'm not, I need to ask him how he sends his last name. Uh, some post apocalyptic fun. It's going to be amazing. And then Sunday, I will leave up to Kevin. What else is going on? Uh, make sure that you you have like one more minute, and then we're gonna do the giveaway for the the fan roll dice stuff. I think that's it for me. Awesome. Let's pass cool, that cool, cool. baton of power to our final contestant here. All right, Kevin. I'm, gonna, I'm gonna relay through it. Here we go. So yeah, hi, I'm Kevin. Uh, tonight I play Devellian Illustriel, who is uh, our favorite pompous Elven uh, blade singer. Which we'll find out more about later. But um, I can be found online at the socials at Kev Ran Games. I am part of the production team here at Wanderers Haven, along with Miko and Beth and Jeremy. I'm not sure where they are on my screen. I'm pointing. But uh, yeah, uh, you can also find me on Fridays. I run a game on the Lanata Turner channel where we do it's a cool grim dark setting and a high fantasy world uh we have a new arc starting this friday so that'd be really cool three awesome players are going to get involved in a murder mystery in a town where there's some weird creepiness going on so that'd be fun but uh yeah check all that stuff out because it's a lot of fun and uh yeah i'm elsewhere too i do a bunch of different stuff 
stuff on SAG, stuff here. But yeah, Sunday we are playing because uh, we have a special show called We Get to Play where we do a little sample adventures and stuff. And this Sunday we get to play the new Avatar Legends game, which will be really cool. We're going to play, you know, do some bending and, you know, do some awesomeness. And Jeremy's there. And I, uh, I think that's it's it. It's not about yeah. yoga, guys. I promise. It's not oh. about yoga. No, it's, it's oh, Avatar. Oh, crap. Avatar it's totally what I was going for there, too. Uh, here we go. Nice. There you go. Oh, wait, wait, wait. My glare is a little weird, but that's what it is. And uh, Jeremy's got one too. He's got, oh yeah, um, yeah, that'll be Wait, a lot of fun. I, I got one too. No, <laughs> I'm so excited for Everybody the game. Now, and you get one, and right? you get one. No, um, but yeah, that'll be a lot of fun. We got some cool folks coming up on to uh, help us tell that story. So yeah, please uh, check us out. That's at 2 p.m. Eastern on this Sunday the fourth. And uh, yeah, we're gonna do that. And then we have something special coming out on the Monday the fifth. We're we talking about that too Monday. Yeah. I did talk about it. I was leaving that to you. Go for it. Oh, okay, cool. So Monday, we are also going to be, it's going to be Miko, who's around here somewhere. Again, I don't know where my, my fingers are pointing. And also our buddy Javante are going to be playing in a coverage of the new uh, Legendary Bundle that is out by Evil Genius Games, the folks who made Everyday Heroes that we covered a couple weeks ago. Check out WrestleMax Heroes if you want. That was a lot of fun. Uh, Super Spy Wrestlers, that was a blast. But um, we are going to be playing uh, a little bit of a coverage of their new Legendary Bundle, which has Pacific Rim and Kong Skull Island rules. So you can play stuff like that. So we're going to be doing a cool Pacific Rim Skull Island adventure coming out on Monday afternoon. Because uh, that's on Kickstarter. So, uh, yeah, they're a really cool company with lots of good stuff. So go check them out. But uh, should we move into giveaways? I mean, the folks have been so patient, so well, kind. Let me do so my quick beautiful. outro before we do before oh, we yeah, jump I into the giveaway. Should give dibs to our GM. Yeah, why not? You know. I have been. Uh, I am Miko. I have uh, been the OKS GM. Uh, it's it's easy to be an OK GM when you've got an amazing cast uh, such as this propping you up. Um, and I cannot wait to continue with part two of this eight part story uh, here on Wednesdays uh, for the next uh, eight weeks. Uh, it's going to be a ton of fun. Um, check out uh, my homebrew world of Estera at uh, uh, the website estera.theoksgm.com. Uh, you can find all the stuff that I am making. It's uh, it's slow going. Uh, I'm transitioning from World Anvil over to a new thing, and so there's a lot of content that still has to end up over there. But but it will get there, uh, and you get to check out some of the awesome stuff that uh, that Beth is contributing to because Beth has uh, graciously accepted my offer to be a co-author uh, over there doing stuff and I cannot be more pleased uh, this has been amazing guys uh, I love all of you I can't wait to see uh, how this story turns out uh, and all the twists and turns and the drama there's going to be a lot of drama <laughs> stuff. Uh, and uh, yeah we'll see you guys next time say nice. bye everyone bye, bye everyone, everyone.